This is the Wednesday, March 15th, 2023 morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning as always. Please call the roll. Good morning. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Wheeler. Here. And uh, now I will turn it over to legal counsel for the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before City Council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with City Council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during City Council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. First up is communications. Item number 204, our first individual, please. Request of Geraldine Misa to address council regarding deaths on Southeast Division Street. Welcome, Geraldine. I think Geraldine was planning to join us on, pers uh, on virtually. Fatima, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, why don't we go, uh, Fatima, hang on for one sec. Let's go to item 205 and we'll hear from Fatima. Mayor, actually, they might all be sharing we, the same. Yes. Oh, okay. So We're using all the same uh, login. Uh, very good. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, Geraldine, you're up. Welcome. Um, well, Geraldine wants to take, she will She will go third one. It's going to be me first, then Susie, then Geraldine, and then, of course, in conclusion, we're going to have our famous Bob. Perfect. That sounds really good. Thank you. Can you see us? Because I don't see if you can see oh, us. Uh, I can't, I don't see your camera turned on, Fatima. Yeah, me neither. So let me see what I'm, um, what we're doing here wrong, because um, it's on, but I don't know why you can't see it. Um, oh, here, start video. Okay. <laughs> it's been a while, looks like. <laughs> yeah, no, now, now you've got it. You've sorted it yes. out. Yes. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Commissioners Fatima uh, Magamadova, Roman Russian Food Store. Since last meeting on January 2023, Commissioner Maps pledged to engage with us regarding safety issues on Division Street within weeks and days. Now it's been months and months and we're still in the dark and anticipating the worst, which is completion of the division project with the same old, same old. And this means no corrections or repairs on our present problems. Speaking of present problems, I would like to show a video of u turn on 117th Avenue and Division, and we're facing same problem on many intersections of Division Street. I was making a oh, oh, U-turn right here. Um, you can see, in order for me to make a U-turn that PBOT says it's um, safe for F450, you hit this pole. And then you have to back out and then continue um, to your destination. So now picture, um, I'm not too sophisticated with my videos today. <laughs> so now picture another example, going south on 117th Avenue to go east on Division Street. You have to turn west in opposite direction to the next U-turn, which is on 105th Avenue. This is over half a mile away, which is 12 blocks away. Then you turn east for, uh, then you turn, you turn and go east for another half a mile to get where you started on 117th. So you can go easterly to your destination. How ridiculous is that? These medians need to be removed. We need to reallocate funds to make Division Street safe again to undo damages that PBA disastrously did on Division Street. Thank you. So now it's going to be Susie. <laughs> All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, members of the City Council. My name is Susie Worthington. I live in a 
retirement community, 400 residents near 166th and Southeast Division. Our neighbors are a community of over 200 residents. I lived here, I have lived here nine years and witnessed the disaster that PBOT has implemented, unrealistic, very unsafe conditions. The Division Street project is in crisis. It is full of de design mistakes causing dangerous, hazardous, unsafe conditions for all. Since true safety is a goal, immediate action needs to happen to correct, redesign, and prevent this design from being used ever again. Uh, remove or reduce the barriers, the medians, and allow left turns. More street lighting is needed everywhere on both sides of the street. Currently, they're just on one side. All signals, crosswalks, bike lanes, bus lanes, et cetera, need to be consistently the same. They're different. By the way, PBOT should have stopped TriMet from reducing our bus stops by half. How could you even okay a design like this? Are you aware that the design has been altered from the original design, creating additional costs, more congestion, confusion, and accidents? This is not a safety corridor. It is a danger corridor. We feel that our safety concerns have been ignored repeatedly. For project concerns, I was referred to Liz Tilstrom of Peabody. She agreed and arranged a time to meet with me and others. She did a no-show with no explanation. 70 other neighborhood resident, residents and business owners arrived for that meeting. Liz constantly def deflected our concerns. One example is Liz told me, it is too soon to see problems with the project. You should wait until it is finished to voice your concerns and then we'll take a look at them. What good is that? I kept all the e emails from Liz. By 2024, a barrier median is planned at 166 to 168. This can't happen. There's only one entrance and one exit driveway that, I, that my community has. Our, it's our only access from our community of 400 elderly residents. Preventing left turns, emergency service vehicles will be delayed. It's a matter of life and death. Currently, we have an obstruction of cement, signal, crosswalk, a bike lane, and a U-turn lane at our exit. The existing medians are not designed for emergency access, and pedestrians have to jaywalk to use those medians. For over for one and a half years, I have communicated with Chris Warner, Peabot Liz Tilstrom, Paulina Salgado of Trimet, Casey and Teo of Raymore, and on and on. I will send I will end this by saying that they have lied to us, deceived us, hidden their plans from us, and need to stop this now. My dear frail friend was killed by vehicular homicide on Southeast Division Street this year. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, appreciate it. And who's up next? Now that was Susie. Hello. Morning, everyone. How are you? Nice to see you. Um, I've never done this before on, on a computer, so I'm a little shaky. I might be a little shaky. Hi. You, you, you look and you sound great. Well, oh, we're, we're glad well, you to don't have see you. my hands trembling, so that's good. <laughs> Hi. Um, good morning, City Council members. Um, my name is Geraldine Misa. I'm just a small part of the wheels and the cogs of this city, although I am very um, active when I see needs that need to be addressed. I've called the mayor's office, I've called the city councilors and um, commissioners and all that kind of stuff. And so here I am, I ran into Susie one day um, when I was at a, a grocery store or somewhere in Ross Center and she told me she was about division and I said, I've been dealing with this for a while, I'm gonna join you. So that's why I'm here with them today. Um, so I, I got to talk fast because I wrote a lot. And Fatima is going to show a couple of pictures of where I've had difficulties almost being hit at 148th and Division and also almost uh, as a pedestrian and then almost being hit on um, 166th and Division going into the theater um, in my car. Um, I'm so scared. <laughs> um, I want to voice and picture the travesties of drivers and pedestrians along Division. 
I want to paint indelible pictures of the nightmarish and abominable destruction of a good and pretty safe road turning into a rat's maze. It is very true of Division and many other poorly designed or redesigned streets in the city. I've driven in many states. I moved here from Connecticut in 20, almost 30 years ago, and I've never seen such lame engineering. I drove across country by myself, and this is just totally lame. Um, the street is dimly lit. There's LED lights on one side of the road, supposedly being ample for eight lanes of traffic, and it's not. It's a scary, frightening road. And I, like I said, I feel like I'm in a, a, a rat's a rat's maze cage. And also I feel like I'm bobsledding in a luge because it's just like you're being channeled and you don't even know which way you're going. Um, I'm kind of an extemporaneous person but doing notes at the same time is hard. It's just an irregular, irregular road. And it's frightening at night in the daytime in this like snowstorm that we had and um, heat. It's abominable, just abominable. Um, we're a varied group of people a varied group of people in this city, as you all know, and you represent us. Um, you know, we pay a lot of money to drive our cars, gas taxes, registration, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we used to be able to drive down Division and do a right turn on red, stop, do a right turn on red after stopping. And um, we can't do that anymore. We're idling and idling and idling. The sequence of traffic lights is inconsistent. I frequently call up lighting management, you know, to tell them about it and um, get through to all different departments. And that light is at 148th and division is consistently off. I was actually felt like I was in a, a sinkhole one time because I went through the light. I thought I, I goofed. And then a couple of days later, it happened again. So I called up and um, there was only like four seconds to get down straight. And there was like three seconds to turn left because the setback is so far that by the time people realize to turn, it's too late. Um, anyways, um, we've had two vehicular homicides on division in the last couple of weeks. Well, you know, uh, within a couple of weeks of each other and within 14 blocks, Fatima talked about like 12, 14 blocks to do a U-turn. It's just nightmares. I'm, do I'm not sure how many of you drive down this road or the other roads are, you know, still have their issues. But if you drive down this road and we do frequently because we're here, you know, we're part of this outer city community and it's it's just awful. Um, two people to die, a young father and a mother. I mean, a senior citizen. And I know that there have been other deaths there too, but what's been done is not solving the problem, has not solved the problem. It's just made it worse. Um, I was turning left to go into the theater another time. I think I told you about almost being hit as a pedestrian by Fred Myers and Carl's. Carl's, by the way, has limited access. They're losing over $10,000 a month in business because of the poor design of the access into their businesses and plus other businesses. I know the manager very well at Carl's on 148. And he told me, um, you know, he could be here, but he told me that he's losing over $10,000 a month in business. Um, so when I was going to turn into the theater, my friend was ahead of me turning and um, all of a sudden they see a car coming towards me, you know, in this, they shouldn't have been going straight, going west, but the guy came into my lane when I was turning left and almost hit me head on and then veered out of the way, you know, and I just was praying. I'm a Catholic. I do the sign of the cross for help and angels, but it was just awful and terrifying. My friend was so shaken up that we, you know, didn't even really watch the movie. We were both terrified of what had, had happened that night just a month or so ago. So I'm so frustrated with division that I picture myself and a crew of others with jackhammers, you know, just kind of pounding it all down and then repaving the roads, you know, a few nights. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I thank you for your time. Like I said, I've talked to commissioners and people before when I see that there's issues. I know that there was a bike lane and we, we don't, we don't, we live here. We don't see bicyclists driving on these roads. We hardly see anybody in the, the double length buses either. You know, we're predominantly a traffic people. So I, I appreciate your listening to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate yeah. you being here. <laughs> you I'm, still did. I'm still shaking. I'm still shaking. Geraldine, truth, truthfully, we can't see it. Uh, you did really well, and we're glad to have your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. You bet.
Uh, Commissioner Maps, did you want to speak now or just at the end? I'll go after Robert. Okay, very good. Welcome, Robert. Welcome, uh, City Council members, underpaid, overworked. Uh, I'm a resident of the City of Portland for since light years ago. Uh, but we are celebrating this morning, celebrating this morning, <laughs> because this is our first year anniversary of being here. Well, we've been here, oh, eight or nine times since uh, last March. So um, we're celebrating, but with empty glasses because there's nothing to celebrate. <laughs> anyway, happy to be here. Uh, so we haven't really heard any response from anyone, except once we got a nice call from Sam Adams and there was another person that was really generous with us. So uh, I want to say that uh, this is, uh, uh, when I was last here, uh, Commissioner Mops said that he had heard some rumors floating around about division problems. So that made me feel like I'm a floater because I'm the one that's been here the most practically plus my team. So I was thinking of starting a uh, rock band called Floaters. <laughs> and our first song will be the uh, Okey Wokey Floaters. <laughs> but anyway, it, we have very little time left before the end of a historic era of the city of Portland. And we're relying on you to end on a good note, a positive note. And I asked the mayor to lighten the load of Peabody. And uh, I had some water samples here, I was gonna show you, but I'm not. But I will tell you that Peabody and the Water Bureau should not be under the same commissioner, particularly where we are today. So there's time to do a better job, be a job proud of, to work together as a team under a good leader like our mayor. And good luck to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thanks all of you. Appreciate your testimony. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I want to thank uh, Geraldine, Fatima, Robert, and Susie for their testimony today. I also want to let you know that I hear you, and I should also say this, as the new commissioner in charge of PBOT, I have at least two jobs. Uh, one of those jobs is to make sure that our transportation system works efficiently, and I am also charged with making sure that our transportation system is safe. Now, um, many people in this room and on this call may have noticed that yesterday PBOT released our Vision Zero report. Um, that's the report that we issue every year on traffic deaths here in Portland. And frankly, uh, friends and colleagues, the news there was not good. Last year, Portland saw, a, saw 63 people die on our roads. That's an 80% jump from the 35 deaths Portland saw, suffered in 2018. Um, and frankly, division is part of this problem. Over the past decade, 20 commuters have died on division and 107 have been seriously injured on that street. Now, the infrastructure changes that we heard about today are part of a larger effort to bring down traffic deaths on division. Uh, let me uh, make two pledges to you before I wrap up today. Uh, moving forward, um, I will work with the Bureau to take a data-driven approach to evaluate how well these uh, this new infrastructure is impacting safety and commerce on division. And I make a second pledge, uh, especially to uh, Geraldine, Fatima, Robert, and Susie. Um, I will come out to division with my staff and meet with you. We'll hear your concerns. We'll take a look at the infrastructure you're concerned about. And I will use your feedback to develop strategies that will make division safer and more efficient and more prosperous. Uh, so if you will indulge me, uh, Robert, Fatima, uh, uh, Susie, and Geraldine, I will ask Shannon on my staff to reach out to your team. We'll find a time when we can all get out there and take a look at what's happening in this space. And I look forward to partnering with you moving forward to figuring out how to make the uh, division the best read it can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'll hand the mic back to thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. 
thank you, first of all, Commissioner Maps. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's good to see all of you. I met most of you when I was out there for a couple hours in December, and I believe everything you're saying. I experienced the U-turn a couple times. Yourself. Yeah, and so I just wanted to say thanks for your persistence, and I know you're focused on safety. And Thank um, you so I, much. I see you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I, I also want to uh, applaud Commissioner Maps. I, I really appreciate the fact that you're being very responsive to what's being said, and I appreciate all of you testifying. Uh, this, Thank this, you so much. Thank you. What, I appreciate that. This is what we hope communications leads to. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Mm -hmm. You okay. bet. Uh, mm -hmm. And I believe we have one more communications item. Mayor, do you mind if I read the other ones into the record? Yeah, go for it. Okay, thank you. you. Um, 205 request of Fatima Magomedova to address council regarding Southeast Division Street Safety. Item 206 request of Robert Butler to address council regarding Southeast Division Street Safety. And item 207 request of Susie Worthington to address council regarding Southeast Division Street Danger. And then the last communication 208 request of Christy Bird to address council regarding crime. I believe Christy was planning to join us in person. Is Christy here? Is she online? She is not online. Okay, very good. Um, if she pops up later, maybe we can take her. Sure. Very good. Uh, have any items been pulled off of the consent agenda? No items have been pulled. Please call the roll. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Consent agenda is adopted. The first time certain item, please. That is item number 209. Approve the designation of six trees as City of Portland Heritage Trees and remove the Heritage Tree designation from seven trees. Colleagues, this is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, colleagues. I'm delighted to introduce this item that is near and dear to many Portlanders. Thank you in particular to the Heritage Trees Commission for your devotion to our beloved assets, our elder trees. Heritage trees are defined because of their age, their size, the type, the historical association, or horticultural value. All are of a special importance to the city. The Heritage Tree Ordinance was adopted by the City Council in 1993, and the first heritage trees were designated in 1994. There are currently 328 heritage trees in Portland representing 134 unique species. I now turn this over to our staff leads on this. We have our forester, Jen Cairo, and also we have the uh, person who I've had conversations with on this topic, uh, Nick Adesse. So welcome, it's all yours, take it away. Thank you, good morning. For the record, my name is Nick Desai. I'm gonna share my screen. I'm a botanic specialist with Urban Forest Trees Science and Policy Work Group. I study trees and how they function in the city. Some of the work that I'm involved with includes canopy studies, policy work, and managing Portland's Heritage Tree Program. I'm here today to present recommendations for new heritage tree designations and also removals of designation for trees that have declined or been re removed in emergency situations. I will begin with a brief program background, including roles and responsibilities in program administration, and then new designations and removals of designation for your consideration. Heritage trees are of great size, age, historical, or horticultural value. As directed by city council, uh, as directed by city code, they are recognized and officially designated by city council following the, a thorough review by Urban Forestry, the Heritage Tree Committee, and the Urban Forestry Commission. Once designated, heritage trees receive the greatest protection conferred upon any tree in the city, and they are required to be preserved unless dead, dying, or dangerous. We currently have 328 active designations in our program. This map shows where they are located. About half are on private property and about half on public property, either in parks or in the right of way. It is important to note that heritage trees on private property are designated with consent of the property owner. Furthermore, city code states that with the consent of a property owner, 
All heirs, assigns, and successors to the property are bound to the designation. As you can see from this map, not all parts of Portland have heritage trees, and we're working actively to expand this program into underrepresented neighborhoods. And uh, as Commissioner mentioned, since 1993, when this program began, the City of Portland has designated a total of 386 trees. While new trees are designated each year, removals do occur as trees age or are impacted by pests, pathogens, and weather. Per Title 11, our city tree code, urban forestry is responsible for overall program management, including permitting and regulation of heritage trees. The Heritage Tree Committee is comprised of staff and volunteers that work together to review nominations and provide recommendations for the Urban Forestry Commission. They also assist with program education for the public. The Urban Forestry Commission is involved with heritage trees in three distinct ways. Reviewing requests for removal when a tree is considered dead or dying, making recommendations for new designations, and making recommendations for removals of designation, which are generally tied to tree decline or storm related failure. The final steps in the process are actions by city council to approve the designation or when appropriate to remove the designation. Now, uh, nominations are due to urban forestry by May 1st of every year. And last year we received 41 nominations across 30 sites with some sites having multiple trees. Nominations are then subjected to a rigorous review process involving initial screening to ensure that baseline criteria are met. For the current cycle, we have six trees recommended for designation and seven which are recommended for removal of designation. Here is a map to show where the new trees are proposed. The color gradient that you see across the city indicates the number of heritage trees by a neighborhood. New designations are indicated by stars with five of them occurring in neighborhoods where we either don't have any existing heritage trees or we have very few. The seven trees for removal are indicated by red X's. Now, I'm happy to introduce the new trees uh, that we propose for our program. And a little disclaimer, none of these photos quite capture the wonder that these trees uh, have. And so I encourage you to seek out for yourself these trees, visit, visit them in our parks, or um, look at uh, some of the maps that are on our website and check them out. But here's a snapshot of the six recommended designations. I'll, uh, describe each in more detail as follows, but of these trees, four are on public property, two are on private property, two of the nominations are for species that we don't currently have in our program, and three nominations bring designation to neighborhoods that currently have one or no heritage trees at all. And so, drum roll please, our first tree is the Copper Beach, located on a residential property in the Hosford Abernathy neighborhood. This large specimen is five feet in diameter and with a height of 71 feet, its capacious canopy rises above the trees and houses. It's pretty impressive to see a beach of this size. London plane tree in Cully would be the second heritage tree in this neighborhood. These photos don't do it justice at all, but with a diameter of nearly six feet, this, tree, this tree is incredibly awe-inspiring. The owner of this tree calls it the goddess tree, and it is thought to be the historic tree painted in a mural at the Kennedy School. This Turkish hazelnut grows in an open field in Knott Park. This tree is so impressive, it received two separate nominations this past year. The size and form are uncommon for Portland, and this would be the first hazelnut in the program and the second heritage tree in Park Rose Heights. It is in excellent condition. It has wonderful branching, as you can see on the photo on the, on the right. And uh, the nuts are edible, though we do suspect that the squirrels get the lion's share of them. This Atlas Cedar is nearly five feet in diameter. <clears throat> it is located on the grounds of the Multnomah Arts Center and has plenty of space for roots and wide spreading branches. The story is that it was planted with the World War II memorial pictured here dated 
May 19th, 1946. And underneath this memorial is a time capsule with the names of local soldiers that served in the war. Port Orford Cedar, located in a wide planting strip along a residential street in Rose City Park neighborhood. This would be only the second such cedar in our program and the second heritage tree in Rose City Park. Standing beside this tree, one notices the deeply furrowed bark, the deep green foliage, and the sounds of birds in the branches, a reminder of the important role of urban trees in providing habitat for wildlife. And our last designation is a Japanese pagoda tree in Arge Park. We only have two other trees of this type in our program, and this would be the very first heritage tree in the Arge Terrace neighborhood. Honoring trees like this in new neighborhoods brings awareness to, their, to, the, to large and unique urban trees and their importance in our novel urban ecosystem. And, and now for the sad news, the removals of designation. Uh, going through these slides is, is like a little bit of a mini eulogy or maybe an Edward Gorey story, if you remember those. Uh, these trees have either experienced partial or total failure during storm or weather related events resulting in emergency removals for public safety or a significant decline rendering them dead or dying. This is the first year in the history of our program where we've actually had more removals than new designations and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. So our first tree is uh, Empress Tree, an Empress Tree formerly located in the Northwest District at the Multnomah Learning Center. Over the years, this tree has been experiencing decline and it was permitted for removal last March. This type of tree is now considered a nuisance species in Portland, so it is the last tree of its kind or was the last tree of its kind in our program. Oregon White Oak, nearly six feet in diameter, was located in Portland Heights Park. It was designated in 1997 and a beloved fixture of the community. Unfortunately, it experienced failure as a result of the winter storm in which occurred last April, which is actually in spring, but it was a winter storm. No one was hurt, but the community gathered to memorialize this tree. American Chestnut in the Selwood neighborhood was a right-of-way tree. It was designated in 1998 and last recorded to be 85 feet tall with a diameter of almost four and a half feet. American Chestnuts are considered rare and this tree had many admirers. It was approved for emergency removal after experiencing failure during a period of heavy rain in early November. Since it took down power lines when it fell, it involved coordination between the utilities and urban forestry operations to clear the right-of-way. We have two cherries on our list for uh, removal of designation. The first is a Royal Ann cherry, and this type of cherry tree was once quite ubiquitous in Portland. This multi-stem tree is in a yard in the Creston Kenilworth neighborhood and has a diameter of nearly five feet, standing over 60 feet tall. Being one of Portland's oldest and largest cherry trees, it has unfortunately been experiencing decline. Urban Forestry Commission approved the removal of designation for this tree in August. However, the property owner continues to care for this tree and has hired arborists to conduct pruning for it as, uh, for safety as it declines. Our second cherry tree is a sweet cherry tree in the Centennial neighborhood and it was designated in 1999. Uh, similar in age and size to the previous, this one had also been experiencing rapid decline in recent years. With concerns about safety, the Urban Forestry Commission approved its removal in November. Uh, this tree was once resplendent with white flowers, um, but with its removal, there are no more cherry trees of this type on the list, and they are now considered a nuisance species. We have two more trees um, to, to review. Um, this one is a hardy dove tree, a unique species producing flowers ornamented with these showy white bracts that look like doves. Uh, there are two of these in our program. Uh, unfortunately, this one was approved for removal due to decline last August, so we only have one more left. So look out for hardy dove trees to bring back into our program. 
And our last sad story is this Northern Red Oak designated in 2017. Standing at nearly 100 feet tall on private property, it was a great presence in the neighborhood, well loved by the property owner and a great source of shade and cooling for the neighborhood. Unfortunately, during a period of extensive heat events in August of last year, this tree experienced failure of a major scaffold limb. And you can see the tear out in the picture here. Follow-up inspections by urban forestry determined that the loss of this limb jeopardized the structural integrity of this tree and emergency removal was approved. So that wraps up our presentation. Six trees for designation, seven trees for removal of designation. Uh, as I mentioned, losing more trees in a year speaks to the importance of finding and pre preserving these quiet sentinels of time and space within our city. As you can see from these two drone photos taken by the property owner of the Grand Fir, the tallest tree in the photo on the left, uh, the Grand Fir that was designated last year, heritage trees stand out among our urban trees, providing a multitude of services for public health and the environment, including a place to rest for birds, such as, such as this young bald eagle that was captured in the upper branches of that very tree. I invite you to explore the Heritage Tree Program and attend some of the events that we've planned as we celebrate our 30th anniversary this summer. Through this link uh, at the bottom of the screen, the public can also access our nomination form and learn more about our program. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Colleagues, any questions at this point? Do we have any public testimony on this item? We have one person signed up. Uh, Charles Bridge, K, Bridge Crane Simka Johnson. Welcome. Beware the Ides of March. It's not so bad, really. Just a little bit of bad news about losing more heritage trees than we've got. And uh, a lot of people concerned about traffic on division. Um, especially as Mayor Wheeler, more than anybody else up there would know, this is not my first time being here for the uh, presentation about heritage trees. Um, I just mostly want to speak to trees in general in that um, when we talk about the heritage trees, when we come around to this time next year, it might be good for, I think, the commissioner in charge will be Commissioner Maps to parallel that with a report uh, on the general uh, health and scope of the urban can tree canopy. Uh, because in the media, we've been hearing that Portland is failing, uh, especially on the east side and in lower income neighborhoods, at maintaining a healthy and growing a healthy tree canopy. So um, with this great work of this presentation and the past heritage tree designation removal presentations, I think that's really an appropriate time, unless we find out as we go into the archives and whatever, that there's a more historically appropriate time to talk about how well the city is also doing, not just in finding uh, exceptional trees, but in making sure that as the city grows or shrinks, as some population numbers are suggesting, uh, we're really making sure that uh, people in areas below the median income are getting the benefits of a healthy tree canopy, houses that are shaded uh, as we um, move into a situation where uh, climate change is giving us heat waves. We, we noticed that one of the trees that was removed here was uh, stress during uh, a record heat situation. So uh, much appreciation to the people who have put in this presentation and for somebody going and making sure that when you go to a nice simple URL like portland.gov slash trees, there's a lot there. And then if you add heritage at the end of portland.gov slash trees, you can see the specifics and uh, get yourself a self-guided tour to see these individual trees. But uh, I think that the main importance of the heritage tree program is to get us to appreciate, nurture, and grow the general urban forestry canopy and to make sure that uh, we maintain, later on we're gonna have the fun of talking a little bit about SDCs and that as the city manages its uh, size, whether that's gross or shrinkage, uh, developers uh, are putting in trees and uh, the canopy is rated in some way so that we know that it's growing and staying healthy. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Appreciate it. Commissioner Maps. Sure. I was just going to thank Bridge Crane for that testimony and that invitation to participate in a discussion about our uh, tree canopy. I do very much care about the tree canopy, and I have a role to play there in terms of uh, the Bureau of Environmental Services, which uses lots of uh, different strategies from concrete to trees to manage stormwater. I believe, however, the uh, tree canopy portfolio uh, largely lives over in parks, uh, but I still basically like the, the concepts here, and certainly this time next year, especially as we bring bureaus together to talk about how we can uh, break down silos between our different, the different parts of the city, I think it would be great to uh, um, have a tree canopy report. I'll work with my colleague and friend, uh, Dan Ryan, to see if we can put something together for this time next year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any further questions or thoughts or discussion? Commissioner Ryan? Yeah, Nick, that was such a great report. Uh, thank you. Could you just do a real quick summary of if someone thinks they have a heritage tree in their yard or in their neighborhood, um, what, what would they do to bring it to your attention? Sure. Uh, sounds like you're asking about a potential heritage tree. Yes, sorry. sorry. Okay, yes. So uh, Portland.gov slash trees slash heritage, there's a form uh, which takes you to the nomination process. So you need to uh, fill out the form, basically uh, describe why the tree is of value or why you think it should be nominated. Um, narrative is fine, photos are great, and a short description of the tree itself. If you can identify the tree, that's great. If you just want to show us uh, where the tree is located, we'll go out there and check it out. Great. So you're responsive to all of those uh, messages. Yes. Great. And if someone wants to, the flip side, uh, the memoriam of a, of a heritage tree, what process do they go through to bring that to your attention? Well, uh, that would be through our permitting department. And uh, generally trees are, as I mentioned in the beginning, heritage trees have the greatest protection of any tree in the city and they can only be removed if they are dead, dying or dangerous. And so if you suspect that your tree is dead, dying or dangerous, uh, we would contact trees at portlandoregon.gov or call 503-823-TREE, T-R-E-E. And uh, if it's an emergency, there's a way to uh, indicate it's an emergency through that phone number, um, dial one. And uh, if it's not. Okay, uh, Nick, you just froze. That's not okay. an emergency, we got the then go through the process for having it from there. Okay, thanks, Nick. So it's a different uh, person, a different uh, line that you contact. It's, it's under permitting, that's what you're saying. If they're dead, dying, or Correct. dangerous. Okay, got it. That's very really helpful to have that succinctly described. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. There being no further business, this is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, please, item number 210. Appoint Sue N. Ho to the Portland Parks and Recreation Board for a term to expire June 30, 2024. This is a report, Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thank you, Mayor. The Parks and Recreation Advisory Board was established by Council in 2001 to ensure that Parks System delivers on its mission to provide healthy parks and natural areas, urban forest management, like we just heard about, recreation services, programming for residents of all ages, and facilities that are accessible to all Portlanders. This year, a board member resigned during their mid-term, mid and the board has selected a candidate to replace them. I want to thank our Parks Board members for their time and passion for Parks and Recreation Services and for their continued engagement. I now have the pleasure to pass this over to Chair Bonnie Geozic, who will share more about the recommended appointee. Take it away, Bonnie. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Um, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, for the record, my name is Bonnie Geozic, and I have the privilege of chairing the Portland Parks and Recreation Board. Um, as a reminder to the commissioners and to bring Commissioner Gonzalez up to speed, um, from our appointment process last summer, we had many exceptional candidates um, and we had a lot of interest in our board. At the time, we recommended two new members be appointed to the board um, to bring uh, added perspectives to our body. Uh, also at that time, we had a third very strong candidate who we asked to consider a midterm appointment should one become available. 
Now that such an appointment availability has become available, we're delighted to recommend Sue Ann Ho to that position. Sue Ann is an urban designer who's taught architecture and design extensively in Oregon and has served on a diverse number of local nonprofit boards and committees. She's lived and worked in Boston, Pittsburgh, New York City, France, and Hong Kong, and has been enjoying Portland Park system since 1993. Her built works are mostly publicly funded projects that focus on seldom recognized cultural history and stories. As an example, in 2006, she was commissioned to design Astoria's Bicentennial Legacy Project, the Garden of Surging Waves in Heritage Square, funding City Hall in the center of that historic downtown. And it received four design awards. <clears throat> Sue Ann is interested in serving on the board because she believes that public parks can bring much needed outdoor joy and relevancy to everyone. I know that this board's advocacy and collaboration will be important for the success of a sustainable future for parks. And so on behalf of myself, the board and the Bureau, we look forward to welcoming Sue Ann to the board. I understand the Bureau has supported, submitted a report for this appointment for your consideration, and I strongly encourage your support and approval. Thank you. Thank you. And does that complete uh, public testimony? I mean, does that complete the presentation? Sorry. Very good. Thank you. Uh, do we have public testimony on this item? It's a report. No one signed up. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report and approve the so appointment. So moved. Commissioner Ryan moves. Can I get a second, please? Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Yes, I wanted to just first of all acknowledge um, my wonderful conversation I had recently with new board member, um, SEO. It was really wonderful to meet in, um, in person. We had such a wonderful dialogue. Thank you for all your passion for this, uh, for the parks and recreation, your passion for urban planning in general, and knowing that the tree canopy must be woven into that. It was a real pleasure to meet you and knowing that you'll be serving as a volunteer on this uh, and the parks board is really um, a great honor to our city. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. I want to uh, thank Ms. Ho for agreeing to serve on this important committee. I vote aye. Wheeler. Great appointment. I'm excited about it. Always happy when people are willing to step up and serve and uh, do so with a lot of experience and a lot of passion. Thank you, Sven. I vote aye. The report's accepted. The appointment's approved. Thank you. Item number 211, it's a proclamation. Proclaim March 23rd, 2023 to be AM 1450 KBPS Centennial Day. Colleagues, our next item is an exciting one. It's a proclamation to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of Benson Polytechnic High School's radio station, well known and beloved throughout the community, AM 1450 KBPS. I'd like to introduce Jacob Patterson, the instructor at KBPS, who will provide some remarks today. Welcome, Jacob. Good morning, Mayor. Um, for the record, my name is Jacob Dean Patterson, J-A-C-O-B-D-E-A-N-P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. I am the current KBPS radio broadcasting instructor at Benson Polytechnic High School and a proud product of PPS and KBPS. I was KBPS student chief of staff 2006, KBPS summer sound host 050609, also part of the first KBPS National Skills USA gold medal champions in 06. I was the KBPS election night coverage co anchor 2012 and 2022. And today I have the honor and privilege of speaking with you for the KBPS 100th anniversary centennial proclamation. Thank you, Mayor, Council members, for allowing us this very special opportunity and recognition. KBPS is the nation's oldest student radio station. The voice of the Portland Public Schools was first licensed to broadcast on March 23rd, 1923. KBPS is the second oldest radio station in the city of Portland. The student body of Benson purchased the radio transmitter and other equipment from Stubbs Electric in Portland for $1,800. Money for the purchase of the station came from the student body funds. The original first call letters of the station were KFIF. The station made its formal debut on air and was officially dedicated on May 4th, 1923, on the opening night of the fifth annual Benson Tech Show. 
Now, KBPS is older than the FCC, which regulates KBPS. In the spring of 1930, the call letters were changed from KFIF to KBPS for Benson Polytechnic School. In 1941, KBPS stopped sharing its frequency with other stations and moved to AM 1450 on the dial, where it is still there today. During World War II, KBPS stopped broadcasting in the early evenings every day so radio operators could monitor signals for incoming distress calls from ships in the Pacific Ocean. In 1971, the FCC gave the station permission to increase daytime transmitting power to 1,000 watts, and KBPS today is licensed for 1,000 watts 24 hours a day. The KBPS studios, transmitter, and 200-foot self-supporting steel tower are located near the rear of the Benson campus. AM 1450 signal reaches about 35 miles out from the tower at Benson. And thanks to amplitude modulation and sky waves, AM 1450 has been heard and recorded all around the world, including in the Netherlands, and we're not talking about the free internet stream on the KBPS website. KBPS has always been years ahead of its time, having women lead the management of the station from the 1940s through the 1990s during a time when men dominated the industry, and from letting girls and Black students host their own shows on AM 1450 during the 50s, 60s, and 70s when Benson was an all-boys school, to providing scholarships to broadcasting students who are minorities through the 80s, to uplifting and employing our LGBTQ students today, KBPS is and always has been dedicated to serving all students. The KBPS program would not be what it is today without the hard work and dedication of generations of KBPS pioneers. We don't have time to mention the thousands of people who've helped make KBPS happen over the last century, but we'd be remiss if we did not mention these KBPS pioneers and instructors Dr. Patricia Swenson, Daryl Concer, Kevin Flink, Tim Underwood, and Steve Naganuma. KBPS Radio was only a school club, and it was not a class when the station first launched in the 20s, the 1920s, but it was Dr. Swenson who helped transform KBPS into an educational curriculum for broadcast students. From 1946 to 1994, KBPS was under the leadership of General Manager Dr. Patricia Swenson. Dr. Swenson helped pioneer educational radio in the United States and won numerous national awards for her efforts. She dedicated her life to making KBPS an example of how an educational public radio station should be operated. The station only operated for six hours a day when Swinson took over, and when she left in 1994, the 14-member staff helped students broadcast days that ran for over 18 hours. Eventually, the KBPS torch was passed on to Kevin Flink, who spent 32 years as the primary broadcast instructor at Benson High School. Kevin retired from teaching in 2007. As a high school student, Kevin Flink was a KBPS sportscaster from 1968 to 71. Kevin was hired at KBPS in August of 1975 to help oversee the student program and to be a producer at the station. His first task was to make the student program as good as any in the nation, and he did it. Kevin came up with a textbook that was used in colleges as an introduction to radio broadcasting and a companion book that would give production exercises. It's called Modern Radio Station Practices, and later editions of this book are still used in the classroom here today. Kevin and KBPS wanted the best program of any high school and the chance to give our students a head start over anyone who was just entering college or wanted to begin a broadcasting career. In the early 1990s, the brand spanking new KBPS Broadcast Center was built on the Benson campus. In the KBPS building at 515 Northeast 15th Avenue, there's two classrooms. Each classroom has two sound-treated audio production studios where students, when they're not working on their textbook, have the opportunity to jump in the booth and work on production assignments. The idea of KBPS is always to keep up to date with what's going on currently in the broadcast industry and giving our students the chance to have a competitive edge over other college students entering the field or anyone just starting out in the business with better production skills and industry knowledge. Now, Kevin Flink was able to make the student program from the 1970s into the 21st century. We have been copied by other school districts and KBPS has won national and regional awards for student programs and has taught many students how to be productive members of our community. 
Kevin was my KBPS teacher, junior and senior years, 2005 and 06 at Benson. And Kevin was with us in Kansas City, Missouri during the summer of 2006 when we won KBPS its first National Skills USA gold medal for audio and radio production. And today, Kevin still blesses the city of Portland with his amazing voice as the PA announcer for Providence Park and many OSAA events. Now, even though there are many, the last KBPS pioneer I'd like to briefly recognize today is Steve Naganuma. Steve is KBPS and Benson class of 1975, started in the program as a student in the fall of 73 and worked his way up to being KBPS chief of remotes by his senior year. After graduating from Benson, Steve was hired as a transmitter technician where he served until 1983. You might recognize Steve Naganuma. He spent 30 years working for some of the top Portland radio stations, K103, Z100, KUPL, Q105, Magic 107, of course, the mighty 62 KGW. Then Steve became a radio teacher himself, teaching part-time at Mountain Hood Community College. And then he came back home to KBPS beginning in 1997, where he served as the main instructor of KBPS until 2021 when he retired. Now, currently, in my second year as the KBPS instructor, I'm dedicating my life to our students and our program. I've grown the number of students in the KBPS program steadily over the last two years. I've secured a new partnership with local community radio station Portland Radio Project. And now PRP airs an hour of KBPS student content every Saturday morning on the FM dial in Portland. I was able to get Oregon Senator Ron Wyden to visit the KBPS studios and do interviews with our students. And not too long ago, uh, Commissioner Ryan was here as well. I've got a brand new updated textbook on the way for students next year. And just last week, we were on the cover of Willamette Week. And we've done interviews recently on some local media as well. My last year, uh, last year, my students were able to interview newly crowned Miss Oregon and Miss Oregon team. And we, of course, interview all of the Rose Festival princesses every year. I could not be more excited about the future of KBPS with a brand new Benson Polytechnic High School coming in a year and a half, new broadcasting facilities, new connections with multimedia teams at Benson and in our community, a new young energetic teacher, a new citywide recognition of our program, the future of KBPS has never looked better. From alumni like Nike founder Phil Knight, to movie star Joel David Moore, to hip-hop sensation Amine, to all the radio and TV stars, I know many, many more are to come, all thanks to KBPS. Happy 100th birthday, AM 1450 KBPS. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. Thank you, Portland, for 100 years of love and support. Thank you. We appreciate that statement. And Jacob, we wish you the very best in the years ahead. You've done a great job here of elaborating the rich history of KBPS, and uh, I know it's in good hands with you. It's great to have you here and to hear your thoughts. Before I read the proclamation, uh, I want to give my colleagues an opportunity to say a few words. I know they, they want to heap praise upon you and your institution and the great work you do. And we'll start with Commissioner Maps, then Commissioner Rubio, then Commissioner Ryan. Um, uh, let me start out by thanking uh, Jacob for that that presentation. Uh, I usually kind of try to occupy the history lane here, and I can, after having looked into the history of uh, this particular radio station, I can tell you, uh, colleagues and listeners, Jacob really did present us with the definitive history of uh, KPPS uh, um, out there. So I encourage future scholars to find this tape when they're trying to uh, uh, put together uh, uh, um, an event to mark the 150th celebration of this grand. And radio station. Uh, with that acknowledgement, uh, let me get to the business at hand. Um, colleagues, I'm delighted to join you in proclaiming March 23rd, 2023 to be AM 1450 KBPS Centennial Day. Of course, KPBS is the radio station operated by students at Benson Polytechnic High School. Now, here's a fun fact. Uh, the BPS in KBPS stands for Benson Polytechnic School. And here 
here is another fun fact which we learned from Jacob today. KPBS is the nation's oldest radio station run by public school students. KBPS made its broadcast debut on May 4th, 1923, which means that this year, KBPS is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Um, and I wanted, as we think about this uh, important day, I'd like to return to uh, and ponder uh, KBPS's origin story, which Jacob told us a little, little bit about. You know, one day back in 1923, a couple of Benson High School students noticed a radio transmitter for sale at a local electronic shop. And those students convinced their colleagues uh, at Benson and school officials to buy that equipment, and the rest is radio history. And speaking of history, it is appropriate that KBPS is celebrating its 100th anniversary as the Benson High School campus is re being rebuilt. The new Benson campus is rising like a phoenix from the ashes of history, and that is a reminder of the proud history and bright future of Benson Polytechnic High School. I'm excited to see what Benson students and KBPS will achieve over the next 100 years. For these reasons and more, I am delighted to join this council in proclaiming March 23rd, 2023 to be AM 1450 KBPS Centennial Day. And I encourage all Portlanders to celebrate this day by tuning in to KBPS at 1450 on your AM radio dial. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Jacob, for your uh, very thorough and thoughtful presentation. It's really great to hear those stories and um, no one can do it, do it better than folks that have been in that role. And so it's especially meaningful that you're, you're here today. Um, I wanna say congratulations to KBPS, the students and staff for this amazing 100 year run on the air. Um, and you know, I was just thinking that given all the advances in technology that we have, we have smartphones, we have, you know, laptops, uh, tablets, everything. It's particularly meaningful that this station continues to thrive in that, and it's clearly a testament to the special place of tradition and history that that the station holds for student and, and alumni. So, um, for that, that re those reasons, it's really great to see um, the station being honored today. So, congratulations and. Um, onward to the next 100 years. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Hey, thank you, Jacob Patterson, and to all your students for your work to keep this proud fabric of our broadcasting industry alive and thriving here in Portland. You do stand on some mighty shoulders. Your humble leadership is seen and appreciated. In fact, the way your radio broadcasting students have kept KBPS thriving during construction out at your temporary campus at Marshall really is a testament to that. As you mentioned, one of my favorite moments was a year ago when student broadcaster Elias interviewed me. Those were some great questions and also some really authentic dialogue. So thank you for having that forum. And here's to 100 more years at, at KBPS and for your leadership during that journey. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to thank you, Jacob. What a wonderful history and presentation from KBPS. Here's to another great 100 years. Jacob, your, your history reminds us, uh, gosh, 100 years. Think of all, all the students who've gone through that program. Think of all the instructors who served all of those students and helped them on their way. Uh, you're part of a very proud legacy, and we're all appreciative of you being here today. It's now my honor to read the proclamation. Mr. Mayor, I, for a point of privilege, I just happened to notice that Gloria uh, is online and it seems to be signed up for this this item. I don't know if she was officially going to testify. Uh, Gloria, we, yeah, would you would you like to say something? We don't um, usually do sign ups for proclamations, <laughs> but you're cert we'd love your perspective if you've got one. Uh, I've been working for KVPS since. I graduated high school, um, so I've been working with the station since 2014. Um, so I, I've seen the transition between Steve Naganuma and Jacob Patterson, so I've kind of helped both of them. And I'm currently in charge of Summer Sound, which is the teen summer job program for the radio station itself. So it's really exciting to see all of these students sign up for this job and apply to it. and expand their skills and their experiences and try to go off into a job that 
is just communication based. It doesn't have to be radio broadcasting based, but they have these skills because of this program. So being from the program myself and getting to communicate with alumni and teachers and instructors and people that are really passionate about this position and about this program, um, it really warms my heart and I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the chance to be in this role and help guide anyone that needs guidance in this program. So thank you again, uh, Mayor and City Commissioners. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Glory. We appreciate your being here today. On behalf of the City Council and by extension, the city itself, a proclamation. Whereas radio station AM 1450 KBPS was first granted a license to broadcast on March 23rd, 1923 on the campus of Benson Polytechnic High School, and whereas AM 1450 KBPS forever affected the lives of the Portland community, present and past students, staff and faculty, and whereas AM 1450 KBPS continues to be run from the campus of Benson Polytechnic High School, owned by the Portland Public School District, with the mission to enrich the lives of youth that major in the radio broadcasting program. And whereas AM 1450 KBPS broadcasting majors and neighborhood schools accepted to the radio station's Summer Sound Youth Job Program experienced a professional work environment to elevate their future. And whereas, AM 1450 KBPS has been dedicated to the diverse listeners in Portland by curating a unique educational program that has helped launch the past, present, and future careers of local and national broadcasters and working professionals while also serving the community by promoting events, local stories, and people of interest. And whereas, thousands of listeners across the Portland metropolitan area Oregon and the United States, and indeed even the world, listen daily for music and programs that cater to the diverse tastes in music. And whereas, the City of Portland wishes to recognize AM 1450 KBPS for their contributions throughout the City of Portland. Now therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim March 23rd, 2023 to be AM 1450 KBPS Centennial Day in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Gloria, for your great leadership. We appreciate it. Colleagues, our next item is item 212. It's an emergency ordinance. Amend system development charge exemptions code to waive system development charges for office to residential conversion projects performing seismic upgrades. Colleagues, these two emergency ordinances, actually, yeah, I see uh, 212 also, please. I'm sorry, 213. Amend seismic design requirements for existing buildings code to adjust the seismic improvement standards of R2 occupancy classifications. Colleagues, these two emergency ordinances modify system development charges and the city's building code respectively in order to incentivize office conversions into residential units. Both of these code changes are important tools to drive investment into vacant offices in our central business district to produce critically needed housing and to create greater mixed use vibrancy in our core with seismically safer buildings. This incentives package is also part of the 90 day work plan that city council committed to advancing earlier this year. Commissioner Rubio, I wanna thank you and your staff for your collaboration and hard work and support in co-introducing this item along with me. I appreciate your leadership in creating much needed housing supply and driving greater economic recovery and resilience in our city. And most of all, I just wanna thank you for your, your personal passion on this front. I wanted to first recognize you for any introductory remarks that you might have as well. Great, thank you so much, Mayor. Um, and I'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge one of your staff uh, people, Andrew 
Fitzpatrick. Um, I want to lift up Andrew's excellent work on this project and appreciate the time he's dedicated to working with the Bureau of, of Development Services and other infrastructure bureaus and the many stakeholders uh, necessary to pull to get together this package of code changes. So thank you, Andrew. Um, as we're all aware, our central city recovery has been slower than many similar cities across the country, and the vacancy rate in our office buildings is about 26% and most likely rising. And at the same time, we are in a housing crisis and must look to every avenue available to increase production. And what we know is that the cost of conver converting offices to housing comes with a very significant price tag, which is why we are bringing these two ordinances forward. Using the, an exemption of system development charges for the cost of seismic retrofit and adjusting our seismic improvement standard for R2 classified buildings, we are hoping to create greater feasibi feasibility for these much needed projects in our central core. I would also like to note that the seismic improvement standard is aligned with other major cities in seismic areas and we are not sacrificing safety for development. These new steps will, be, will support greater activation in public spaces and increased foot traffic for small businesses and help revitalize the central district. It will also help achieve our goals for sustainability by increasing density in the central city, connecting people with transit to reduce commuting and encouraging repurposed buildings instead of new construction. So I will now pass it on to Andrew Fitzpatrick to present these two items. Thanks, Commissioner. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Good morning. City Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrew Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of Economic Development on the Mayor's team, and I'm privileged uh, for the opportunity to speak with you about these two important items this morning. I'll focus my remarks on the overall policy justification underlying these code changes, our process to get here today, and on the details of item 212 in particular, the creation of system development charge exemptions for qualifying office to residential conversions. And I'll allow my colleague from the Bureau of Development Services, Amit Kumar, to speak with a lot greater uh, technical expertise on item 213 than I could possibly. So thank you for being here as well. With both code changes, the challenges that we are trying to address are our critical shortage of housing supply and our central business district that lacks sufficient residential occupancy and as a result has recovered more slowly than other peer cities. We have a number of office buildings that will remain largely vacant with limited demand for commercial office space unless we intervene to incentivize new investments into adaptive reuse. The office vacancy rate of the Central Business District today is currently 25.8%, which will likely continue to rise as office tenants exit leases or downsize their space. At the same time, Central City foot traffic is key for small businesses, for cultural events and the activation of the public realm, and for community safety. More Central City residents may be connected to mass transit and require shorter commutes, as Commissioner Rubio mentioned. Their homes can reuse existing buildings rather than relying on the costlier carbon footprint of new construction. In response to these objectives, we are proposing to exempt from SDC's office conversions that must undergo seismic retrofitting for residential use, one of the biggest cost drivers that often makes these projects financially infeasible. As you all know, when a building undergoes a change of use, from office to residential in this case, it typically is required to undergo a seismic upgrade due to its elevated hazard classification. This work, in combination with other hard costs of renovation, often make these projects prohibitively expensive with insufficient returns to cost. Office buildings have generally already been hooked up to city infrastructure and have often already paid SDCs previously. The beneficiary of an exemption must sign a covenant to preserve the housing units created for at least 10 years in this ordinance. The overall project must also comply with existing inclusionary housing requirements. The size of the SDC exemption may not exceed the lesser of the actual cost of the seismic retrofit or $3 million. The exemption sunsets in 2027 to stimulate near-term investment and to allow for council oversight and reassessment. Over the last seven months, we consulted with engineering, architecture, and construction firms, property owners and developers, housing advocates, business groups, and neighborhood associations. We also work closely with the Bureau of Development Services, the Portland Housing Bureau, the City Attorney's Office, Prosper Portland, the Bureau of Revenue, and our Infrastructure Bureau counterparts to arrive at this proposal. We appreciate their guidance and partnership. We spoke with and studied approaches from other cities like Calgary, Alberta, and Canada, Washington, D.C., 
Chicago, and San Francisco. Given the financial and structural complexity of this work, it's safe to say that no one has this completely figured out yet. Portland can now be a leader in innovating new approaches to reinventing its central city. Prosper Portland continues to work with Eco Northwest and the global design firm Gensler to make further recommendations for generating conversion activity, which they both have pointed to as a key ingredient in medium and long-term mixed-use vibrancy and economic resilience in our central business district. We recognize that due to the major financial undertaking of conversions, even for structurally accommodating buildings, that we still have a lot more work to do as a city and alongside other levels of government to incentivize conversions effectively. We have asked the state legislature to provide further layered incentives. We are proud of this significant step in the right direction as we drive investment into adaptive reuse, into centrally located housing, and into a signal that Portland is taking decisive action to spur our economic recovery and revitalization. Thank you for your time and attention, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you, appreciate it. Now I understand we're gonna hear from Amit and Doug. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Amit Kumar. I am the Supervising Structural Engineer with the Bureau of Development Services. I'm here today to testify on the proposed changes to the city's Title 24.85. The proposed code amendments are intended to support city's priorities related to housing creation and reactivation or conversion of existing vacant or underutilized buildings to residential units. Among several factors identified as potential barriers to the conversion of office space to residential units is the current requirements in city's Title 24.85. Current regulations would require a building undergoing a change of occupancy from office to residential to be seismically upgraded. The current standard for this type of upgrade is called ASCE 41 BPON. Simply put, it is a standard equivalent to that for which new buildings are built. The proposal is to revise the improvement standard from the AC 41 BPON to a BPOE standard uh, BPOE stands for a basic performance objective for existing buildings. This standard is a nationally accepted standard deemed appropriate for existing buildings. The standard uses a slightly lower earthquake ground motion compared to BPON standard. Buildings meeting the proposed BPOE standard are expected to experience little damage from relatively moderate and more frequent earthquakes but may experience more damage from the most severe and infrequent earthquake compared to buildings improved to the current BPON standard. The proposed BPOE standard is considered a life safety standard where occupants of the building are expected to exit safely in the event of the most severe infrequent earthquakes. This standard acknowledges and accepts some of the differences between an existing building and a newly constructed building. For example, the risk is tempered by a recognition that an existing building likely has a shorter remaining life compared to a new building and thus has a smaller chance of experiencing the most severe and infrequent earthquake event over its remaining years. The constraints of existing building often make achieving the same level of performance rel reliability as a new building much more expensive and the cost is often disproportionate to the incremental benefit. Accepting the BPOE standard also ensures that recently constructed buildings and those that have recently been improved to modern standards are not immediately considered deficient whenever the code changes. So newer buildings and those that have been recently improved would not need any additional upgrades to meet the current standards. Above all, the BPOE standard is a protective of life safety and corresponds to the performance objectives of new buildings although it is accepting of a greater level of damage in the event of the most severe earthquake. In addition, BPOE also approximates the regulatory policy traditionally applied to existing buildings in many seismically active areas of the United States, such as Seattle, San Francisco, San Francisco and Los Angeles. This change would bring the city of Portland in alignment with the requirements of seismic upgrades in other major cities along the West Coast. As part of our outreach, BDS presented this proposal to groups such as BOMA, which is the Building Owners and Managers Association, NIOP, which is the National Association of Industrial and Office Properties, BDS's Development Review Advisory Committee, and BDS's Structural Engineering Advisory Committee, and have their support for the proposed code amendment. So in conclusion, the projects intended to convert existing office spaces to residential use have many challenges. 
This code amendment will lower one of the barriers and support the city's goals to create additional housing and reactivate vacant or underutilized building space. Thank you. Thank you. And was Doug also going to present today or just? No, this is. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Colleagues, any questions before I open this up to uh, uh, public testimony? Very good. Keelan, do we have anybody signed up for public testimony? We do. For both items, we have 11 people signed up. I'm sorry? For both items, we have 11 people total. Very good. Three minutes each. Name for the record, please. First up, we have Cole Merkel joining us online. Welcome, Cole. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Cole Merkel. I'm one of the co-directors of Here Together, the organization that convenes the 250-plus member coalition of businesses, service providers, and community leaders. Together, we advocate for comprehensive, proven policies to address homelessness in the Portland metro region. Today, I'm here to advocate on behalf of the coalition in favor of agenda items 212 and 213, code changes that aim to incentivize residential to office conversion. Taking steps like the one we urge you to make today with approval of these code changes is exactly how we'll begin to make headway on the daunting challenge of closing our housing supply gap. Yesterday, I submitted a letter to public testimony signed by 34 organizations and businesses and 40 community leaders, inclu including nonprofit and for-profit housing developers in support of these code changes. Moreover, the Here Together Coalition has expressed our support for office to residential conversions in both the 2022 and 2023 roadmaps to accelerate relief to our region's homeless and housing crisis. We desperately need housing of all kinds to address homelessness, and we should uh, embrace creative opportunities for new housing. We appreciate you all taking this step today. Streamlining office conversions will allow private, public, and nonprofit developers to create desperately needed housing options and help breathe new life into buildings previously used as office space, a necessity as telecommuting has become a reality for many in the workforce. This will also be critical to supporting a vibrant city center. In addition to these code changes, we encourage the city to work to develop affordable housing at all levels, especially with deeply affordable units. While these conversions won't be strictly limited to affordable housing, we recognize that increasing the housing supply at all levels uh, is critical to providing more housing for everyone in our community. We appreciate you all considering these. We hope that you'll vote yes. And we know that this vote will only be part of the solution to Portland's housing and homelessness crisis, but it's an important opportunity to bring more desperately needed housing online. Thank you so much for considering. We urge you to vote yes on this creative opportunity and thank you for your time. Thank you, Cole. Next up, we have John Isaacs. Welcome, John. Uh, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is John Isaacs. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Portland Business Alliance. I'm a resident of Southeast Portland. I prefer he, him pronouns. I'm here today on behalf of the Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce to support, to support agenda items 212 and 213, which will start the process of converting obsolete office buildings to residential through incentives and modernized seismic requirements. Last month, we released our annual State of the Portland Regional Economy Report. As many of you know, it was a very sobering report. And among a host of alarming data about the health of, a, of the economy of our city were the following points. Downtown Portland has had the third slowest recovery among the 62 largest cities in the nation based on foot traffic. This is due to Portland's higher than average dependency on office workers and Portland having one of the highest work from home rates in the nation. Visitor foot traffic is only down 27% from pre-pandemic levels, but office worker traffic is down nearly 50%. And comparatively to our peers, Portland does not have a high percentage of people living in the downtown area. Downtown Portland has a 26% office vacancy rate, not counting leases that are not being used, leaving over 8 million square feet of commercial space currently vacant. This is going to result in the largest year-over-year -year drop in property tax revenues to local governments from downtown commercial property since 1997. I focus on these points because it is reasonable to assume that downtowns as we know it are not going to return. And due to the pre-pandemic makeup of Portland's daily downtown use, Portland was more susceptible to these shifts in human office work preferences than our peer cities. If we are to support the recovery of our beloved downtown, the heartbeat of our state's economy, 
and take the opportunity to add badly needed housing units to our city supply. We need to promote policies like these ordinances to make downtowns a place where people can live and work. And we need to start putting the policies in place now that will facilitate the conversion of antiquated commercial buildings to residential, which will take several years to come to fruition. I want to be clear that this is not going to solve our urgent housing crisis on its own. Conversions are more expensive than new housing developments, but nevertheless, in the long term, it will be an important part of the mix in keeping downtown Portland sustainably thriving for decades to come. We support this ordinance because it is a good first step in the right direction, but as we have discussed with all of you, conversions are very expensive. The ordinance, in fact, states it perfectly, and I'm just going to read straight from it. In the absence of significant financial incentives, office buildings that are otherwise structurally feasible to be converted are unlikely to be changed into residential units because of the cost of undergoing conversions, especially the size of upgrades necessary. For this reason, we urge the council to adopt these ordinances, but to not stop there, we hope you will subsequently act to adopt stronger incentives to develop new affordable and middle housing slash timelines and steps for permits to build housing and eliminate unnecessary policy-based requirements we have stacked on developers over the years. These ordinances are, ordinances are a good start, but please keep going and be remembered as the council who met the moment and finally took the actions our housing emergency requires. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and, and we'll take you up on that challenge. We look forward to working with you and others. Great. Thank you. Next up, we have Sarah Fisher. Welcome, Sarah. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Sarah Fisher, and I'm the priest at Saints Peter and Paul Episcopal Church in Southeast Portland. I'm a member of the Levin Community Land and Housing Coalition and a member of the Here Together Coalition. I've been a Portland resident for nearly 40 years and have lived in all four quadrants of the city, including right here in downtown. I support these ordinance changes and urge each one of you to vote yes. I am here because I believe, as I hope that you all do, that housing is a human right, not an earned privilege. In my parish, I care for people who long to get off the streets, given adequate support, employment, and transportation options. Creating additional housing downtown would directly or indirectly serve many people that I care about people that I know and people that I don't know who are currently living in tents. I think about them when I listen to the rain on the roof of my cozy home. I think about them as I urge you to clear the way for additional housing in Portland. I am also here for myself. I love Portland and I've always loved our downtown. I'm not one of those people who ever stopped coming downtown to eat or shop, but I miss the vibrancy of our city. I notice the empty spots where there used to be shops and restaurants. I notice the empty sidewalks where there used to be people. Increasing the number of Portlanders who call downtown home will increase foot traffic in downtown, increase the labor pool for street level businesses and contribute to the overall revitalization of downtown. We can bring Portland back, we can. I'm excited about the prospect of converting underutilized office spaces into affordable housing. I urge you not only to pass these ordinance changes as a first step, but to keep your sights on the North Star of increasing the amount of housing where all Portlanders can afford to live. Thank you for your work to alleviate unnecessary suffering in our city. Next up, we have Michi Slick online. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Michi Slick, and I am a principal with Killian Pacific. Um, Sarah Zahn, who is testifying next, and I are both members of Oregon Smart Growth, and we're both here today as Portland-based real estate developers. Portland is where I live and where I work and raise my family, and the firms that Sarah and I represent are homegrown. Portland's future is very much our future. 
And Oregon Smart Growth has long advocated to increase housing production in Portland and across Oregon as a critical strategy to address our housing affordability crisis, reduce homelessness, and enhance our shared economic prosperity. We were really heartened to see the council resolution last fall that specifically called out action steps to increase housing production. And as you know, our region needs to produce 295,000 additional housing units, both market rate and regulated affordable by 2040 to make up for past underproduction and to be prepared for future growth. That need is even more acute as our city struggles to recover from the pandemic, especially in the central city. It's against this backdrop that you're considering these ordinances, which we fully support, that embrace the innovative idea of converting underutilized office space to residential use, which in turn produces needed housing and adds residents that will enhance the vibrancy of our central city. These are laudable goals. And most notably, the city and Andrew Fitzpatrick assembled a work group that included myself and other members of the development community to provide technical input to the city and to engage in really great collaborative conversations as these ordinances were in development. I also want to be very clear that office to residential conversions are an extremely challenging type of development and the projects carry significant risk. These projects are typically more expensive than constructing a new building and also pose tremendous schedule and cost risk because of the unknowns that exist when renovating a building. The ordinances before you today are very important in laying the groundwork to eventually enable office to residential conversions, but they will most likely not result in additional housing units in Portland in the near term. Significant additional incentives would be required to make projects like these immediately feasible. So we have much more to do to address our housing needs and our central city, and we owe it to our community to continue working together with urgency to tackle both of these items. Sarah Zahn, who is testifying next, will share our best thinking on next steps to have a material impact on housing production in the near and midterm. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Miki. We appreciate it. Thank you. And next up, we have Sarah Zahn. Welcome, Sarah. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Uh, my name is Sarah Zahn. I am the Chief Operating Officer of Urban Development Partners, a local real estate developer here in Portland. And I also currently serve as the chair, as the board chair of Oregon Smart Growth. Like Michi before me, I am very heartened that the current city council is taking the issue of housing production so seriously. These ordinances before you today represent the kind of collaboration we have long sought with the city. Your team considered an out of the box idea, engaged stakeholders effectively and evaluated technical information to craft policy solutions. Now we're here to urge you today to keep going. Oregon Smart Growth offers four additional bold ideas to meaningfully move the needle on housing production in Portland. First, Let's reform Portland's inclusionary housing program to increase production of market rate and affordable units. I'm currently serving on the stakeholder work group for the inclusionary housing calibration study analysis that's already an analysis that's already several years overdue. We are working hard as a group and will soon share a series of recommendations to the Portland Housing Bureau. We hope PHB and the city will take a hard look at the recommendations from this work group and act quickly. We cannot afford to wait another year to get this program right. Second, we recommend or hope uh, to encourage you to implement an SDC moratorium or defer SDCs on all housing projects. Our housing state of emergency requires prioritizing housing above the many investments our city needs. A temporary moratorium on SDCs or deferrals for housing projects will make development more feasible. Third, we want to uh, urge you to rapidly evaluate the multi-dwelling and middle housing regulation surveys results and move swiftly to implement regulatory changes. Uh, Commissioner Rubio, we sincerely appreciate the opportunity to share firsthand our experience with the city's many regulations. While we support the goals behind many of the regulations in question, including climate resiliency, energy efficiency, transportation choices, and livability, all of which are laudable goals, they often stack together to make it difficult to create 
places for Portlanders to live. We include, encourage you to boldly prioritize what can be paused until we are on track to meet our local housing production goals. And finally, uh, we hope to see speedy, uh, permits speeded up. The city can take bold action and adopt a 120 day rule per, uh, for permit issuance with the option to submit the permit to a third party review firm for approval if the city can't meet that timeline. We urge you to look for additional resources to add more permitting staff and consider ideas like self-certification for certain types of permits, such as limited improvements to free up permitting staff to focus on other applications. Oregon Smart Growth is committed to staying at the table with you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Perfect, perfect timing. Appreciate your testimony. Next up, we have Kai Krennic. Welcome. I think Kai may be online. Hey. Good. Yes, I'm online today. Uh, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Kai Krinick. I'm the owner of Fuel Yoga Workouts. We're a boutique uh, fitness studio, yoga studio, a uh, small local retailer tenant down here in downtown Portland, right down the street from me on 2nd and Taylor. I'm here to speak in favor of these two items, 212 and 213. I've had my business open in downtown Portland for six years. Um, and needless to say, in the last six years, I've seen a lot of change. Uh, most notably in the past three years. What was previously a pretty heavily utilized business district has noticeably changed into an area of, call it underutilization. Um, and business tenants have moved out, uh, more employees are staying home um, or working from hybrid models. And it seems like a, a vacuum has been created, um, one that needs to fill. Um, as a brick and mortar in the downtown area, we rely really heavily on the health and the usage of the area's other businesses and buildings. Uh, and with this area's transformation, and I've seen a substantial decrease in customers. Um, uh, I've seen a substantial decrease in foot traffic in the area vibrance, um, and it's resulted in a significant decrease in revenue. Um, it's a real and significant challenge for a business. Um, so we need more usage of space and buildings in the area, not less. And it seems a logical step to take is to facilitate the transformation from commercial to residential. Um, the, the usage landscape has changed, so let's create these opportunities and incentives for properties to adapt to the change landscape uh, and support the local businesses uh, like mine, like the others, um, all the ones that we have deep roots here in um, the Portland core and the community. So thanks for your time. Um, I appreciate you. And I encourage you to vote in favor of these two items. Thanks, Kai. Next up, we have Preston Korst. Good morning, Preston. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Council, uh, Mayor. Um, I'm, my name is Preston Korst. I am the Director of Government Affairs at the Home Building Association of Greater Portland. Um, at our association, we represent six local counties here in the region, as well as 40 uh, municipalities and cities within the area, which keeps me very busy, um, in addition to, of course, service districts and utility areas. Um, uh, usually when I start these sorts of testimonies, I. Uh, I say that uh, our association really only is, in our industry, um, really only is as strong as our members are. Um, and of course that's true, but that's only uh, part truth. Uh, when in reality, um, our industry um, really is only as strong as um, local governments are effective. Um, and of course, I don't think it's any surprise uh, to folks here that um, the local construction and re uh, residential um, construction industry is perhaps the most regulated and impacted um, industry uh, by local government than any other uh, that operate um, in, in our area, of course. Um, which is why, of course, um, I'm particularly grateful to be here today um, as a city, we hope, will take um, an, ad an additional step to uh, be more effective um, and increase its uh, goals and parameters around uh, housing production and housing affordability, which um, of course, we believe these two um, agenda items will do um, over time. Of course, they won't solve the entire um, housing crisis within our region or within the city, um, but it is an important lever that we encourage you all to vote for today. Um, and in addition, as John and others mentioned, um, it, it is one important step, but we um, are encouraged by the fact that the city um, staff um, and council um, is even considering uh, taking such an effective move. So we appreciate it, um, and we hope that you will continue to work with us and as with members and, as again, you guys have 
already uh, made the rounds to the um, to the business industry and the home builders. Um, and I just hope that you guys continue to take those steps. And I appreciate um, your hearing our testimony. Um, and I encourage you all to vote uh, in favor of these two amendments. Thanks. Next up, we have Jim Atwood. Welcome. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mayor and Council people. My name is My name is Jim Atwood, and I have some poster boards uh, left from prior testimony I gave to the council on another matter. I don't think uh, most of you were here except for Mayor Wheeler, but this is a building, uh, a downtown building that I have, and I think that uh, possibly the costs of the uh, seismic upgrades, even at the reduced requirements, have been uh, uh, underestimated. The 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 elephant in the room isn't the system development charges, it's the cost of the seismic upgrade. Uh, just to recap uh, quickly, for this particular building, uh, which Prosper Portland uh, encouraged me to do a feasibility study on, the cost of doing a seismic upgrade, uh, and which involved basically gutting the interior, putting in the framework, and then rebuilding the interior was approximately double the cost of simply tearing it down and building a new building. This is evident throughout the city, just a few blocks from here. I was in contact with the California developer who was developing this building on a Taylor between 3rd and 4th. Uh, he wanted to redevelop uh, this property, and uh, some of these walls are up to uh, over two feet thick, but because of the seismic upgrade requirements, he did end up demolishing it, and it took six days to demolish uh, to uh, build a new building. Um, this morning's Oregonian on the cover page is a story about the uh, Yamaguchi Hotel uh, down at 4th and Gleason, and it's being demolished, and uh, undoubtedly it's because of the seismic upgrade requirements. So if you really want to throw developers and property owners a bone to uh, encourage housing, and I was... I, was, I served on the Downtown Housing Advisory Committee under uh, Mayor Neil Goldschmidt decades ago. I'm a strong advocate for downtown housing. Uh, you should consider uh, eliminating the requirement for the seismic upgrades. I noticed in the ordinances here today, you're talking about giving uh, a waiver of system development charges to people who are doing seismic upgrades, but the seismic upgrade basically makes a lot of these conversions not feasible. And I know that my uh, gentleman on my right, Mr. Ahmed, is a strong advocate of seismic upgrades, but essentially uh, there's just not enough money uh, to make it worthwhile. Uh, as business owners, uh, you know, if we have a major earthquake we're, and our buildings collapse, we're ruined. So, it, you know, this is important to us too. And if there was, if it was financially feasible to uh, seismic upgrade our buildings, we'd do it. I think these existing buildings are an important uh, part of the fabric of the city, and uh, I'd like to uh, just throw it out there that if you can reduce the seismic, uh, reduce or eliminate the seismic update requirement, that uh, you'll do something to contribute to more downtown housing. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. May I ask, Mr. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Gonzalez. Oh, I had, uh, Commissioner Armstrong. Uh, Quick question for you, Mr. Atwood. Um, yes. Were you showing us a pro forma of uh, conversion? Is that what was on the billboard? Uh, this is a actually, it's a cost analysis of the actual renovation, which uh, was, um, and this is in 2015 dollars, by the way, a million seven hundred seventy-three thousand, and at the time, the replacement uh, cost of the bill of a similar sized building on that lot was 940,000. Got it. What was the uh, price per square foot on conversion? Uh, so it's, the, the building has above grade 5,825 square feet. I, I, I can't do the math in my head, but just the hard cost of the seismic upgrade was 907,000. So I, I think that's about 160 bucks a foot. That was $2,015. Uh, yeah, 2015. And that, and that uh, uh, doesn't include soft costs for engineering, permits, legal and accounting, financing, and so forth. Okay. So uh, 
907,000 for 5,825 square feet. And when we get to the end, I'll have some follow-up questions for Mr. Fitzpatrick on this, but thank you very much for your testimony. It's very Thank you. Next up, we have Rich Crane, Charles Simca Johnson. Thank you. I think you let me one slide on saying, for the record, I'm Charles Simca, Bridge Crane Johnson, or maybe I got it in. But um, you've heard a lot of great reasons uh, to vote yes. We started off with testimony from Cole Merkel, who uh, has roots going back into uh, Street Roots. He used to be a significant figure at Street Roots. Um, we should also think about the reasons why you should vote no on this. Um, and mostly the only reason that exists is uh, about having your ducks in a row. Uh, I guess this is an emergency item. And of course, Ted and I have had little snarky comments about what constitutes an emergency as a procedural matter and what's a real emergency. And the real emergency, of course, exists highlighted by the point in time count, which tells us about the thousands of people living outdoors. Um, and so ducks in a row would mean that before you vote yes on this, you would have an actual plan to take those thousands of people living outdoors and provide them with safe, hygienic indoor shelter. And you don't yet have a plan for that. You occasionally talk about pop-up pet projects that will address 100 out of thousands of people. I think on the 18th of March, uh, the mayor's gonna be at a town hall about the work on 82nd. Hopefully we'll get some RV safe parking, although many people there, of course, don't think that's the best place for it. Um, and then there's other little nuances about why you maybe should vote no on this, uh, because the SDCs uh, came up. The housing crisis is not a reason for blanket SDC waivers. What you need to craft is a tool appropriate to the job. When somebody's doing a development, such as you know, the hopefully gonna succeed big uh, Ritz-Carlton next to the gallery where Target is, those people don't need SDC waivers. Their job is to recoup that expense from the millionaires that will be living there. Now, SDC waivers, when you're housing people that need deeply affordable housing, if those projects are viable, that's a great time for SDC waivers. So we have to weigh the no of this kind of far looking idea of maybe we can have some affordable housing in spaces that is commercial versus the fact that we don't have a plan that actually talks about the real numbers from the point in time count, thousands of people, and addressing that at the scale and scope it exists instead of just saying, oh, every few months, will rescue 100 or 90 or 107 people out of those thousands of people that are living outdoors. And so when we weigh those things, it is true that y'all should vote unanimously, vote yes to get this going so that we can maintain a vibrant downtown, have more people living here. Um, I didn't take time to look at who owns the old First Interstate Bank, which is now Wells Fargo, but there's great windows over there. Somebody should rent that or buy it at a very high price. But you can vote yes on this, but more important is urgent action beyond what's just gonna happen on 82nd for the full scope of people covered by the point in time count. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Monta Knudsen. I think Monta was gonna join us online. I don't see them. Is Monta here? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Brian Wanamaker. Welcome, Brian. Morning, Mr. Mayor. Morning, good to see Mr. you in Mayor. person. Good morning, my name is Brian Wanamaker. And I'm a re real estate redeveloper with over 25 years experiencing, experience redeveloping areas in Portland primarily for housing and commercial retail in North and Northeast Portland. In 2014, I bought a beautiful office building on Northwest 4th and Gleason in Old Town that was sitting empty and dark. <clears throat> it's a beautifully restored building, fully retrofit with steel framing for office occupancy. I was able to add tenants and stabilize the building. But during the COVID pandemic, the users stopped coming to the office and have since all moved out. The building is back to basically sitting empty as it was when I bought it 
but now there's virtually no chance of finding a tenant to take any part of the building, let alone to fill it enough to keep the lights on. <clears throat> I see my choices as converting to housing or shut the building down and let it sit empty again as it was when I purchased it in 2014. I'm not alone in this experience or in the dilemma of deciding what to do with a nearly empty office building. <clears throat> Portland's downtown real estate market is in crisis mode. The demand for commercial space has plummeted and vacancies and bankruptcies will get much worse as existing commercial leases expire. At the same time, there's a critical need for housing downtown. Yet the obvious solution, converting commercial buildings to residential, is not feasible, primarily due to Portland seismic upgrade regulations. <clears throat> The regulations miss the main point, that Portland's seismic regulations make conversions exorbitantly expensive because they overstate the hazard level of residential occupancy compared to commercial. While many building codes treat residential occupancies as a higher risk than commercial, that is primarily due to risks associated with fire, not seismic events. It is my understanding that many state codes, including Oregon's, do not view residential occupancy as more hazardous than commercial in regards to seismic upgrade requirements. Neither does the gold standard of building code agencies, the International Code Council. Some other cities may have regulations similar to Portland's, but those are by no means typical ones. I'm currently attempting to convert a downtown Old Town building that I own to create about 80 to 100 new units of housing in a neighborhood where people are currently sleeping outside. The building has recently had a full seismic upgrade. It's legal to fill with 1,000 commercial occupants and has exiting and fire measures designed for that many occupants. But Portland Seismic Codes says that housing only 200 residents, all long-term familiar with the building, would require another full seismic upgrade, even though the building can legally house five times that many commercial occupants. The, ch the changes proposed today will make that conversion less unfeasible. And my case is typical. We need basic changes to Portland seismic codes, one that would bring more in line with the International Code Council regulations in order to really have an impact on housing downtown. The proposed changes are a step forward, but it remains uncertain if the proposed changes go far enough to encourage converting safe office space into much needed housing. Brian, before, before you disappear, first of all, I wanna thank you. Uh, you've been leading in this area for many, many years before it became a big topic of discussion in the, in the wake of the COVID pandemic. I think you and I had a conversation about this probably 10 years ago, and you were, you were an innovator and leader in that regard, and I want to acknowledge that first and foremost. Second of all, I've been having lots of conversations with lots of people about your building and the perceived inequities between commercial and residential seismic codes, and that is something I'm very interested in running to ground with my team. And so I, I, I want to be clear, what we do today can always be revised in terms of the overall seismic codes. Um, but I just want you to know, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm hearing the arguments and many of them are very compelling to me. I appreciate your being here today. Commissioner Gonzalez has a question. Uh, sure. Brian, a follow-up question. Uh, in reviewing this proposed code, what would you project, project on a per square basis uh, your seismic upgrades would be if you converted it to, to residential? With the current code? Uh, you, you mean I'm really looking to get both, but whichever number you'd have at your fingerprints. So. Oh, I mean, it's uh, millions, millions and millions of dollars okay. right now. The building was upgraded um, already. So like I say, there's this differentiation between um, office occupancy, which allows for a stunning amount of people compared to um, housing occupancy. And I'm unclear why why Portland varied from the, um, the ICC code, but they did in 95 and decided to sort of continue with a different code, separating the residential component from the office component. So the occupant loads for office space are significantly higher than for residential. Um, and I'm unclear why that is the case, but that is currently where it sits. 
Sure, and the reason for the question is just to, as much for listeners listening at home, the, the sheer magnitude of seismic upgrades on the project costs when we're talking about this conversion, it so outweighs everything else, at least on the performers I have seen, that it's, it's uh, I don't think we can overstate the, the impact and the barrier it is to creating affordable housing in the city. So I, um, we'll circle back when we get to Mr. Fitzpatrick on this, but thank you for your testimony. Thanks Thank for being here, Brian. Appreciate it. And that completes testimony. Very good. Colleagues, any questions at this particular juncture? Commissioner Maps? Nope. Nope. Commissioner Ryan? Yeah. Following up on the testimony that we had from Mr. Atwood, I just wanted to hear your response to some of what he had to say about retrofit and the whole expense with that. And, you know, it was very important to listen to that. And I do think it was unearthed that is an elephant in the room, and I just wanted to make sure that I heard your response and thinking by that great testimony we heard earlier. A couple of uh, responses there. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Bryan was talking about uh, the discrepancy between commercial and residential. Uh, this ordinance where we are moving the, uh, lowering the requirement from a BPO and upgrade to a BPO upgrade essentially addresses that issue. Uh, so basically, the uh, residential uh, occupancy is being treated similar to an occupancy for an office building. So they'll be doing the same standard that they're doing for, uh, for a new office building. So I think that addresses the issue that Mr. Bryan was talking about. Uh, the one that Mr. Atwood was talking about, the, the cost of conversion uh, uh, seismic upgrades, it is definitely uh, an expensive uh, proposition to do any kind of a seismic upgrade. And if you compare it to a building a new building, that is true. Uh, but I think these older buildings, which are unreinforced masonry buildings, they are uh, have been proven in earthquake after an earthquake to be very dangerous buildings. Uh, you know, we have seen what happened recently in Turkey uh, with these type of construction in there. So seismic safety is important uh, when we deal. Yes, the cost is there, but the importance to the safety of occupants of the building is also very important. And I assume this topic is discussed in other cities that are taking this on. Is there a network nationally, uh, internationally, and I heard Canada was mentioned that's on this topic, looking at those uh, uh, as far as, challenges you know, with financing? Unreals for the masonry buildings, yes, there is, you know, being uh, standards being developed, all you know, the international standards that are there that specifically address uh, uh, unreinforced masonry construction, and these are the type of buildings that have been separated out from other types of constructions. Uh, and in city after city, they have adopted, especially in uh, the Bay Area and uh, uh, California, special ordinances have been taken to address these specific types of buildings because they pose uh, a bigger danger than other types of construction. Could I just ask a, a follow-up on that? We, we don't have to resolve this today, but, but it is an interesting question. I think it's a worthy area for us to, to continue to follow up on. The case was made that the seismic standard is different for residential than commercial. And it seems to me if somebody's working in the building or living in the building during the day, you value those lives equally. Right. And so why, what is the basis of the different standard for residential? Is, is it because they're in the building longer? Is it because it's the fire code issue? What is the fundamental difference? And is there a different way we could mitigate that funda the risk of that fundamental difference? What, what is the difference? I mean, uh, th these, uh, the way these were classified back in 1995 uh, and we adopted this existing building code, I, I think it is not just, the, it is the nature of occupancy of the, of the, the people who live in those buildings. For example, in residential uh, occupancies, you have children living in this building. You have elderly people living in these buildings in here. They are not as, you know, if you're living in an office space building, you are working there, you know how to, you know, uh, exit the building in an earthquake kind of stuff, where you have people living overnight in a building in here they're, you know, with children and elderly people who are not capable of self-preservation. So they are treated a little bit differently than people who are living, working during the day in an office space. So that was probably one of the fundamental reasons why uh, they were classified as a higher hazard, because of the nature of occupants in the building. Okay, and, and is that based on assumptions or is that based on some 
statistical risk-based modeling? What, what is that based on? Uh, again, it was just based on, you know, uh, back in, in the olden days where we had this uh, old code, uh, old uh, conservancy code. And uh, it was just based on the nature of occupancy. I, it okay. was not, uh, I'm just, and, and by the way, you do a great job. I, I got a, a tremendous compliment from a constituent just yesterday on, apparently you've had multiple, I won't mention his name today, but you've had multiple interactions with him. And he said that Amit guy is great, uh, true problem solver. Um, but I, I'd like to explore this yeah. a little more and really get to what we think is the fundamental difference in whether we are evaluating the risk appropriately and whether or not there are other mitigating strategies that could use, be used that don't require a completely different seismic retrofit for one type of building versus another. If we have a massive earthquake right now, this building often has people with disabilities, it often has children, right. it has all kinds of little rats, warrens were all throughout this, this old building. Um, and the earthquake isn't gonna know whether I'm living here or whether I'm working here and it's not gonna care. So my question is simply, do, do we have the calculus right? And, and I, I was compelled by the arguments that were made that you know, other municipalities have a different national standard than what we're using. I just wanna make sure we're not overreaching and overburdening the, uh, 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 you know, overtaxing the those who who seem willing to invest in affordable housing in our community. So right. if, if we could just sort of explore, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I want to be very clear. I just think it's worthy of follow up. Right, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to assure you, we have already started that conversation. We have uh, brought this issue up with our Structural Engineering Advisory Committee, uh, and we are hoping that we'll come back to Council either later this year or early next year with some other recommendation addressing this issue. Great, now, I, and I, I really appreciate that. At the risk of sounding even more nerdy than I already do, uh, I'd like to see the math, yeah. and I'm sure you would too. Thanks, I appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Commissioner Gonzalez has one. I just want to Question. echo the mayor's comments there and then, you know, partially recognize the difficulty of the, uh, the policy choice we have to make here, right? So we're we're protecting future citizens of a, against a seismic event, which by definition is likely catastrophic, at least in the scenarios where these codes come into play. Um, balancing that against a real true emergency on our streets and the lack of affordable housing right now. And um, so I fully appreciate the, the difficult policy trade-off we have to make here, um, in particular because one is before our eyes and is a definite, and one is potentially in the future uh, that's often hard to weigh those two things against each other. So I just want to acknowledge the difficulty and appreciate the work you've done here. Um, this question is as much for Mr. Fitzpatrick, but either of you can ask, answer. Um, there was quite a bit of industry analysis of seismic upgrade costs under our existing code, and that was circulating quite a bit in the fall and winter as uh, the dialogue about this subject really started to accelerate, not just in Portland, but uh, to a certain extent in North America. And I'm just trying to gauge where we are, we think, on the, you know, has anything changed in sort of the estimation of, getting back to the question I asked both developers, the the, the cost per square foot of, of meeting Portland seismic uh, code upgrades standards here. I'm just sort of trying to get a ballpark uh, if you have any current information, including with this code change. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. I, I don't think anything about the city's requirements have elevated costs more in the intervening months, but. I do think costs of capital have been continued to increase and construction costs, of, of course, have been inflated over time. So we have seen some of the estimates continue to rise. And I'm, I know you've seen some pro formas. We're happy to also share some of the ones that uh, some of the folks that even have testified have shared with us just to demonstrate the enormity of the costs. And I think this, this measure is something that is a good starting point, but of course we need to do a lot more as a city and we hope that we will have s some help from the state as well as a critical resource to layer on incentives. Yeah, and I, I, I said it before and I just don't wanna belabor the point, but the, the magnitude of that hurdle is so significant uh, that it is standing in the way of affordable housing without question right now. Yeah. Um, the, uh, follow up. On that, uh, well, actually, I wanted to jump to a technical question in Table 2485B. I just want to make sure I follow line two and three. What are the differences there? I just wanted—I couldn't quite follow what we were trying to say 
I'm looking at more than one third of area or 100. And, just trying to understand the difference right. between line two and three there. So basically, uh, what that table is saying is that if you are changing an occupancy, and the occupancy change affects more than one third of the building area, then that triggers a seismic upgrade. So if you're doing anything less, you know, one third or less you know, change of occupancy, you are not required to do a seismic upgrade. I totally follow the difference between line one and two. I just didn't really follow what you're trying to do with line two and three there. So there are basically two triggers in there. One is the one-third the area, and then the other is that if you're adding 150 or more occupants, then it triggers a seismic upgrade. So it's either of the two. So if in table 2485A, you have different hazard categories, and if you're changing an occupancy and it's in the same hazard category, then if you're adding more than 150 people, occupants, that triggers a seismic upgrade. But if you're going from a lower hazard to a higher hazard, then you have this additional uh, trigger of more than one third the number of occupants. So that's what that table is talking about. Totally makes sense to me. You might just take another look at line two and three and see if they can be consolidated. Because when I look at that, I'm wondering if they're really one and two are telling two different stories. But on mine, line two and three are basically the same triggers. Uh, and they look duplicative other than the last column relative hazard classification. Different classifications. Yeah. That's I, I just wonder you can do it in one line, but that's a Scrivener's thing. So it's, uh, you know, I, I think those are all my questions for now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you both. Great. Colleagues, any other questions? Commissioner Rubio, no? Great. All right. Uh, please, uh, these are both emergency ordinances. Please call the roll on item 212. Rubio. Um, so, are we making our comments on this one or the next uh, uh, one? Yeah, I'll probably make it on the first one. Okay, sure. great. Um, first, I want to say thank you to you, Mayor, um, for taking leadership on this since last year and the collaborative efforts of you and your team with our bureaus um, that these uh, that has resulted in bringing these ordinances before us. Um, thanks for calling us all to action on our responsibility to do our part to increase the housing supply during this time. Um, Andrew, Doug, I mean, thank you all for your presentations and all of the work behind the scenes um, that has culminated in today and bringing these ch changes forward today. Um, it's a lot of work and I, I, I think that uh, bears repeating that um, it was thoughtfully done. So thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge all of the folks that came to testify today. Um, very good insight, very great um, comments to us um, and things for us to follow up on. Um, it's clear that this action today is striking a chord um, and also some places to dig deeper um, and bringing some hope about revitalizing our central city. Really excited for this project and look forward to seeing how it spurs housing development um, out of these buildings. So great work and I'm happy to vote aye. Ryan. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Andrew and Amit, uh, for the presentation and for the extremely helpful testimony to all those who are here today. The testimony indicated enthusiastic support to provide more housing, and you also all revealed very different interests and concerns. This diverse coalition alone coming together speaks to why this must move forward today. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for seeing this through. I know the conversations that were started last fall with the mayor's office. I was in those conversations and quickly the hurdles and obstacles mixed with excitement to move forward was real. The fact that we are here today says a lot about the collaboration from many sectors in our community, sectors who are no, not always on the same page and offices across government who are also not always on the same page. Landing uh, this next step to move forward is a big deal. So congratulations. This is, cons this is really complex and very bold and today, this is the right step. We will learn a lot in real time, along with other cities. I really encourage us to be a part of a learning network. It's not a Portland knows best moment. It's uh, really uh, connecting with others around the country and in Canada that are doing this to make it possible for us to add housing and ensure safety for residents living in this promising housing and to pencil this out to attract builders in real time. I think that's what we're getting at the heart of the matter. Will this pencil out and still provide the seismic upgrades that are necessary. And clearly that's uh, work that's continuing and that dialogue's fresh and real and raw. <laughs> I ask that we remain open uh, to make adjustments to this visionary policy to get the results we all desire. I'll end with a story. Last week I was engaging with many interests about restoring one square in downtown Portland, um, O'Brien Square. 
we had experts in design. We had providers of those, those who were seeking behavioral health services. We had owners of large buildings. And lastly, and perhaps to me, the most important voices I was hearing was very passionate small business owners and current residents downtown. Why? Because they actually are downtown. They don't have a choice. They live there. They're trying to survive in their small businesses. They don't have the luxury, like some of their business owners that are above them, of being remote. They have to go to work and hope that someone shows up at their shops every day. These are the people that are front and center for all of us up here because we all know that our downtown every day needs one thing, and that's more activation, more joy on our streets. Our plazas and squares will be a big part of that. So this is one part of that activation um, ecosystem that we must really dive into right now. And so as we prioritize this activation uh, so that we have, we can keep thinking out of the box and providing more residents in central part of Portland. Clearly, we need to figure out the well-named elephant in the room around the seismic upgrades. We must humbly work with other cities again to adapt and learn in real time. This is a start. This item will be back to us, I assume, frequently, because we're just getting started. Well, let's go. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Uh, I just want to appreciate your work here on this essential matter um, as we try to re kick, uh, uh, kick start the reemergence of downtown. Uh, getting people to live down here is a, is a big piece of that. Um, at the same time, we address this affordability crisis in our community. So uh, this is essential work. Appreciate the urgency that you've tackled it. I do want to acknowledge two pieces. Again, to reiterate, these we're going to be facing a number of difficult policy trade-offs when it comes to our code around housing. And this is but one of many, or really, frankly, two of many, that we will uh, be addressing, hopefully, in the coming years. And every one of these code provisions had a reason for it, had justification for it. And I just want to acknowledge that there's work to do when we say, well, for right now, we have to focus on affordability, even if we're, there are other trade-offs that were had venerable reasons why they were in the code. So uh, I, this will be one of many. I also recognize a reality. This is not going to do anything to alleviate the shelter shortage in our community today. It won't address our shelter needs six months from now. These will have medium-term impacts, positive impacts, um, several years from now. Uh, and yet we still have to do that work. We, the, the affordability crisis in our community um, will not be solved overnight. Uh, it will take multitude of years attracting capital and getting projects done in the city to alleviate that challenge. So we have to do both of these simultaneously, address our shelter needs and remove barriers to investment in the city of Portland. Uh, not, to, not to say the least about our behavioral crisis, behavior health crisis in the city of Portland, addiction and mental illness that are a big part of what many Portlanders feel when they see the homeless on our street. So I just want to acknowledge we have to do this medium term work simultaneously with addressing those other issues that are uh, facing us on the streets. Um, one last note on seismic, um, you know, I, I'm really hopeful that our state and federal partners will eventually uh, help us and other Western cities address this because um, and I think this is the third time I've said it, but the barriers here are so substantial uh, for these projects to actually come online in urban settings that um, we've taken a step here. It's going to help, but uh, I'm concerned it's not nearly enough to really kickstart some of this development we'd like. And I think we're going to need help from the states and feds to really make those pro formas uh, viable. One last note, it's just a technical piece on system development charges. When we're talking affordable housing, there are often waivers already of some sort. So I just want, for those listening in, um, those already exist. This seems to take it a step further, which I think will help more of these projects pencil. So uh, for all those reasons, again, thank you for your work. I vote aye. Max. Um, I want to thank everyone who testified today, and I want to thank the mayor and Commissioner Rubio for the end of wave of work they've done on this ordinance. I vote aye. Wheeler. This is a really interesting subject, and I want to thank Commissioner Rubio, and I want to thank Andrew and Amit. I want to thank you for, I, I know you guys have put hundreds of hours into this, and 
initially I wasn't really sure how we were going to break this up into ordinances and how we were going to present it in a way that would make it easy to understand. And you did an exceptional job in terms of how you've organized this, the action steps you've proposed for this council to put in place, the outreach that you've done in the community. And I, I appreciate the fact we heard a diversity of opinions from people we don't usually hear from here at City Hall. And uh, that was great. I also just have to go to the macro issues here. The macro issues are these. The nature of work in urban areas has fundamentally changed and we're not going back. We have an excess of office space relative to what's going to be needed in the future. And we even heard testimony from one of our commercial space owners and operators that his concern is if he can't figure out an alternative to office space, his building will stand vacant along with many, many others here in the urban core. That's sort of the first <coughs> macro issue. The second macro issue is we have too many thousands of people living on our streets and too many people who cannot afford the increasing cost of housing in our community, and this is where the opportunity is. But that opportunity only makes sense if it pencils out, and that's just the hardcore reality. So we have to figure out the right balance between incentives, costs, regulations, and the cost of capital coming into these projects in order for it to be successful. Finally, we have data that shows that one of the reasons why Portland's recovery from the COVID pandemic and its resulting economic shutdown has been so sluggish in the central city is because we don't have a lot of housing in the central city. And I was pleased to hear Jim's comments about working for uh, a previous mayor decades ago where that was raised as a fundamental concern. And that has definitely played out factually. Cities that had more housing in their mix in their central cities recovered much faster than cities like Portland that do not. And even here locally, we saw neighborhoods that have a mix of commercial, industrial, and housing recovered much, much more quickly than parts of the city that did not have that mix. So if we want to be relevant going forward, this is the kind of strategy that we need to pursue and think about. And it causes us to rethink some of the rules that were put into place in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s. They may not have aged so well, given the challenges and the realities of 2023. So I, I encourage us as we move forward to continue to reevaluate the assumptions behind some of the regulations and ask ourselves, do we still have the balance right? Maybe we do, but maybe we don't. And if we don't, we should revisit that. Uh, again, I really want to underscore what others have said, that this is not the solution to our homeless crisis. Far from it. But this is an important tool that can be used to further our suite of responses to the homeless crisis while we also address the fundamental question of what makes an urban area successful in a post-COVID environment. So I'm really proud of this work collectively on the council's part. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's uh, team uh, collectiveness on this and our community stakeholders who helped shape this fundamentally and to you two gentlemen who worked so tirelessly on it. I vote aye and the ordinance is adopted. And I'll be much briefer on the next one. Item number 213, please, also an emergency ordinance. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Colleagues, before we jump to the regular agenda, let's take a 10 minute break. We are in recess for 10 minutes.
everyone. Uh, item number 216, a proclamation, please. Proclaim March 12th through the 18th, 2023, to be AmeriCorps Week. Colleagues, as Keelan just indicated, the next item on the agenda is a proclamation proclaiming March 12th through 18th, 2023, to be AmeriCorps Week. I'd now like to introduce our speakers. I don't know if I have them in the right order or not, but Carrie Bauer, who's the Director of Campus Compact of Oregon, Carmen Dennison, the Executive Director of Campus Compact of Oregon, April Quast, Project Director of the Multnomah County Foster Grandparent Program, Carolyn Tidings, AmeriCorps VISTA and Training Coordinator, and Amanda Hard, Program Manager of the Metropolitan Family Services to present on this proclamation. And I believe we're beginning with Carrie, if I've got my notes correct. Yes, hi, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, and thank you so much for having us today. Um, so for the record, my name is Carrie Bauer, and I'm the director of Oregon Serves. Oregon Serves is the State Service Commission for Oregon, and our role in the state is to promote AmeriCorps volunteerism and civic engagement opportunities. These opportunities both increase the capacity of communities to meet their most pressing needs and also provide a path for those serving in the local AmeriCorps programs to get a leg up on reaching their education and career goals. AmeriCorps members and volunteers across our state provide services to address critical needs in the areas of education, health, public safety, environmental stewardship, disaster response, youth, senior, veteran services, and more. They serve in schools, colleges, nonprofits, and local government agencies. And often that is that service is enabling them to launch their public service careers from the skills and networks that they developed. Since 1994, when AmeriCorps formed, over 21,000 people have served in Oregon, including in Portland, for a total of 29 million hours which always knocks my socks off to, to think of that. That's such a huge impact in local communities. So on behalf of the commission, I just wanted to sincerely thank you for recognizing the impact that members and volunteers are making every year by issuing a proclamation to celebrate AmeriCorps Week. You're going to hear next from programs that serve on the front line of COVID response in Portland that supported local schools and food banks and making sure that students' nutrition needs were met during COVID. Um, you're also going to hear from some programs that support local foster families and youth. I'm inspired to be a part of this work every day because of the likes of those that you're going to hear from. And again, we just thank you for making this proclamation today and sending a powerful message that their service is valued and appreciated. Thanks. I do also want to let you know that uh, Carmen, who is the executive director of Campus Compact, unfortunately did have to um, cancel uh, last minute, but sends their gratitude along and I know um, would be happy to send further information about some of the innovative work that they're doing around Portland. So I think next you'll actually hear from April. Very good. Thank you. Welcome, April. Hello. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Persons. I am the program coordinator with the Foster Grandparent Program. So Multnomah, Multnomah County's Foster Grandparent Program creates opportunities for older adults in the Tri-County area to connect, mentor, tutor youth and their communities. The volunteers who participate in the program have expertise from their professional and their lived lives to share with the, in the areas that they volunteer in. In order to serve in the program, the volunteer needs to meet the 200% poverty level guideline or greater and pass a background check. The volunteers serving in the foster grandparent program also receive benefits from their volunteer engagement. The fellowship from the other volunteers, along with ongoing education and services trainings, help them to keep engaged. The stipend they receive helps them maintain some financial stability within their modest household budget. We also support the volunteers by connecting to resources such as rental or utility assistance and other services through the aging disability and resource connection. Prior to the pandemic, the volunteer foster grandparents positively impacted the lives of 168 children per year in the areas of academic, social, life skills, and behavioral support. Grandparents are placed at schools, Head Start programs, and after school programs within the communities they, they live in, which gives the grandparent and the youth additional resources in their neighborhood. I wanted to share some feedback from station supervisors that they provided when the completing evaluations with the volunteers. 
Grandma is an excellent in her service and presence with our infant group of children, Community Action Start, Head Start. Grandma is such a joy to have with us. She works hard and the children love having her here and are always excited to see her, Albina Head Start. Miss Volunteer is a pleasure to have on campus. We, loved her, we love her positivity and care for the students, Portland Opportunities Industrialization Center. Grandpa is a source of patience and cheerfulness in our classroom, and we are thankful, thankful to have him, Albina Head Start. I just wanted to share the impact that the programs have with the kids and with the grandparents, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. And then Carolyn, I assume you're next, is that correct? I believe so. Thanks so much. Welcome. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caroline Tidings. I use pronouns she and they. I am the project director for the Oregon Health Authority AmeriCorps VISTA Partnership Project. We are in our 15th year of our partnership with AmeriCorps, and we have members who serve across the state of Oregon in statewide organizations, local public health departments, tribal governments, and community-based organizations, as well as nonprofits. Uh, our project aim is to alleviate, prevent, and reduce poverty in Oregon through really building that system capacity and through expanding health equity. We currently have 12 members serving throughout Oregon, and six of those members are serving here in Portland. Um, we typically have two cohorts per year, one in the spring and one in the fall, and we often hear that our cohort supports that we provide is just one aspect that is particularly useful to our members during their service year. So we have members serving across the state, but they really have that you know, cohort, cohort base of support. Um, our program also provides training and professional development as well as team building activities, because um, it's really important for us to invest in our members and further develop their interest in service to local communities. And through this and through a strong relationship with our members, we often see members continue to work in public health within Portland and within the state of Oregon. Um, so really, we see that the program is a wonderful source of workforce development, and we get these, you know, really excited um, volunteers coming in to do a year of service that often stay within the state uh, and within Portland to build that workforce development. Uh, I myself started with this program as a volunteer in service to America in 2016, um, and I've continued in public health since then and now get to manage the program that I loved being a part of years ago. And uh, so through building the capacity of organizations that promote public health in Portland, our members really leave a lasting impact on the community. And some examples of the current projects members are working on currently in Portland include preparedness planning and evaluation, medical surge preparedness, health equity partnerships and communications, public health volunteer and community engagement, public health modernization, and um, also CSA partnerships and food coordination. Uh, a large pillar of our program is really ensuring that the project work is community led. Our program acknowledges that our members have often have really wonderful skills, but it's also vital to empower the community to take that strength-based approach and build the capacity. Um, so host site organizations regularly sing the praises of the skills of AmeriCorps VISTAs, um, the skills that they bring and acknowledge that the work that they do really builds that capacity to serve community in a way that wouldn't get done without the participation in this program. And I really see that as the biggest impact aside from workforce development, that there's so much great work to be done, but we don't always have the funding or the staffing and AmeriCorps VISTAs really bridge that gap for organizations in Portland and grow the capacity to serve more Portlanders and more Oregonians. Um, so thank you all so much for acknowledging the importance of these volunteers today. And um, our program is even currently recruiting for new members. So if you're interested in learning more about our program or know someone who might be interested in applying, please feel free to reach out to me or take a look at our website. Um, you can just Google Oregon Health Authority VISTA program. Thank you all so much. Thank you, we appreciate it. And last but not least, Amanda Hard, welcome. Hey, thank you. Um, good afternoon and happy AmeriCorps Appreciation Week. Uh, so my name is Amanda Hart and I got my start with both AmeriCorps and Metropolitan Family Service nearly 12 years ago as an AmeriCorps member serving in the SUN program at Shaver Elementary. So go Tigers. Uh, this was the first year that MFS hosted an AmeriCorps team. And after my two years of service in the MFS SUM program, I knew that this was the kind of uh, community-centered work for me. 
So now 10 years later, it's been beyond gratifying to watch pilot programs that I supported as an AmeriCorps member, like our school-based food pantries, social emotional learning, youth-focused financial empowerment, and tax prep outreach become integral service offerings in our communities. At MFS, as a multi-service, culturally responsive organization that has been serving people across the lifespan throughout Greater Portland since 1950, we recognize that we do a lot. <laughs> we also recognize that we could not do all this incredible work and show up for our communities in the same intentional way without the energy, compassion, and commitment from our AmeriCorps members. Their fresh ideas, diverse perspectives, and thoughtful questions always inspire us to offer the best versions of our programs and ourselves. One of the programs I'd like to highlight is MFS Hunger Relief and our school-based food pantries. So it started as a bi-monthly U-Haul rental to pick up food for about 20 families at Shaver during my AmeriCorps service has now grown to serve upwards of 880 families every week, Monday through Friday, across five school communities in East Portland. During the height of the COVID pandemic, it was one of our only programs that continued to run and even expanded, transforming into an all-outdoors distribution that provided free, fresh food to all. This was possible because of our AmeriCorps members that year who showed up every day in lots of rain, sometimes shine and sometimes snow and brought that same passion and dedication to serving their community. So thank you to the Portland City Council for creating this space today to recognize all of our service members, as well as creating innovative programs like the Portland Clean Energy Fund, which supports our MFS mission to build a future of AmeriCorps that is more accessible, inclusive, and reflective of the experiences and voices of our communities. Thank you and cheers to getting things done. Thank you, appreciate it. And uh, I believe that completes the presentations of those who are going to present. Uh, at this point, colleagues, before I read the proclamation, I'll turn it over to you for any comments or questions. Commissioner Maps, I see your hand is raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, I am glad to join you in proclaiming March 12th through March 18th, 2023 to be AmeriCorps Week here in Portland, Oregon. As we learn today, AmeriCorps is an independent federal agency that connects more than 5 million Americans to public service opportunities. The agency's mission is to improve lives, strengthen communities, and foster civic engagement through service and volunteering. AmeriCorps programs include, but are not limited to, AmeriCorps Senior and AmeriCorps VISTA. Of course, the America or Senior Program uh, consists of a variety of opportunities that connect senior citizens with volunteer opportunities. AmeriCorps VISTA was founded in 1965 as a domestic version of the Peace Corps Program. AmeriCorps VISTA provides full-time volunteers to nonprofits, faith groups, community organizations, and public agencies. Now, in more than 1,200 communities across these United States, more than 5,000 VISTA volunteers help individuals and communities rise out of poverty. And I am very familiar with the AmeriCorps VISTA program. I used to be executive director for an organization called Historic Park Rose. Now, as many of you know, Historic Park Rose is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting equitable economic development in East Portland. And when I worked at Historic Park Rose, I worked with many AmeriCorps VISTA volunteers. But today, I wanna to take a moment to celebrate one VISTA volunteer in particular. Her name is Kate Conan. Now, uh, for many years, Kate worked as my chief of staff at Historic Park Rose. Kate played an indispensable ro role in making Park Rose a healthier, safer, and more prosperous neighborhood. For example, Kate helped organize neighborhood cleanups and the Taste of Park Rose Street Fair. Kate helped get crosswalks built and murals painted, and she helped storefront spruce up uh, the outsides of their buildings. Now, Kate left Historic Park Rose and the VISTA program many years ago, but even today, when I walk through the Park Rose neighborhood, I can still see the legacy that Kate and the AmeriCorps program left behind, which is why I'm glad to have this opportunity 
to honor Kate and all of the other volunteers at the AmeriCorps program for working here in Portland. And I want to do that by joining my colleagues in proclaiming March 12th through March 18th, 2023 to be AmeriCorps Week here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here today to hear about um, all of the, the presentation was great. And anyone that comes from the nonprofit sector like I do as an executive director in 2008, we were um, really hit with a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, both our, our graduation rate was one of the worst in the country, especially for children and students of color. And we also were in the, the big um, recession, if you will. So it was financially challenging to build at that time. And if it wasn't for AmeriCorps volunteers uh, working with us and more in the network that included Metropolitan Family Services, it was just key to building the capacity that many of you spoke to. So this is a wonderful program. It's great to see all of you keeping it going. And uh, I'm grateful that the Clinton administration um, gave this the juice it needed. And it's still here years later. So anyway, congratulations. I hope you feel really good about the impact you're making in the community. And thanks for allowing us to take a time today to, to pause and, and be grateful for AmeriCorps volunteers in this week. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Ryan. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. I just want to jump in and also commend uh, the local AmeriCorps members um, and seniors on their service to the community. Um, and hats off to all of the volunteers who served um, uh, and continue to serve in Portland, and particularly those who helped out during the pandemic. Um, those are really critical times. Um, and uh, I, too, have seen firsthand the impact um, of uh, these volunteers on our nonprofit community and in the community. So. Um, really appreciate that. Everyone's testimonies were very compelling and they highlight the power of service and the ability to improve people's lives. So I'm really glad we're honoring um, this important institution today and we're better for your service. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Gonzalez. I'm just so proud to participate in celebrating the almost 50 years. AmeriCorps has been energizing volunteers across our country. Uh, my, both my parents and in-laws both served in AmeriCorps' overseas uh, cousin, the Peace Corps. And so uh, the energy and uh, connection that comes from volunteering, uh, I just would like to celebrate. Uh, with that, I tip my hat to your organization and am honored to join in proclaiming the week of March 12th through 18th, 2023 as AmeriCorps Celebration Week. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'd like to begin by reiterating the mission statement of AmeriCorps. It is to improve lives, strengthen communities, and foster civic engagement through service and volunteering. Through an impressive array of programs, we heard many of them today, AmeriCorps has been an indispensable way for Americans to give back to their communities. In particular, I'd like to recognize the volunteers of AmeriCorps who provided much needed help to their communities during the worst moments of the COVID-19 pandemic. Nationwide, at least 10,000 AmeriCorps members and volunteers spent time helping others during the pandemic. Over 100,000 wellness checks were conducted, almost 16 million pounds of food was collected and distributed to those who are most in need. When our communities needed them, AmeriCorps volunteers and members stepped up and they provided. To all of you who put your neighbors and your community first, thank you. You're a shining example of what we can accomplish when we help one another. Now it's my honor on behalf of the City Council to read a proclamation. Whereas service is a hallmark of the American character and has the unique ability to bring people of all backgrounds together in common cause, and throughout our history, citizens have stepped up to meet our most pressing challenges of the day by volunteering in their communities. And whereas AmeriCorps and AmeriCorps seniors programs provide opportunities for the more than 200,000 Americans to serve their communities through services at nonprofits, schools, public agencies, and community and faith-based groups all across the United States. And whereas in Portland, more than 311 AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps seniors Volunteers of diverse ages and backgrounds helped to meet the local needs at more than 154 locations in the Portland area by responding to COVID-19, tutoring or mentoring children and youth, supporting veterans and military families, 
combating the opioid epidemic, restoring the environment, and responding to disasters. And whereas, AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps seniors volunteers encourage collaboration and partnerships, leveraging millions of volunteers and service, and acquiring the support of businesses, foundations, and other local partners to increase the effectiveness of their initiatives. And whereas, AmeriCorps and AmeriCorps seniors programs bring together people across race, age, and zip codes to address the critical issues facing our country, forge relationships, and cultivate mutual respect, and help build resilient and thriving communities. And whereas, AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps senior volunteers demonstrate commitment, dedication, and patriotism by making an intensive commitment to service, a commitment that remains with them throughout their future endeavors. And whereas, through their service, AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps senior volunteers strengthen the lives of their families, communities, and Portlanders as a whole. Whereas, national service represents a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solutions and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community impact and increase the return on taxpayer dollars. And whereas, AmeriCorps Week is an opportunity for all of us to recognize the dedication and the commitment of the more than 1.2 million Americans who've chosen to serve their country through AmeriCorps and millions more who have served in AmeriCorps seniors and their community partners and to encourage more Americans to follow in their footsteps of service. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of Roses, do hereby proclaim March 12th through 18th, 2023, to be AmeriCorps Week in Portland and urge citizens to thank AmeriCorps members and alumni and AmeriCorps seniors volunteers for their service and to find their own ways to give back to their communities. Thank you, all of you who testified today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Next on our agenda is item number 217, a resolution. Appoint Tim Pitts and Sherry Smith to the Police Accountability Commission. Joining us today is Samir Kanal of the Community Safety Division to introduce this item. Welcome, Samir. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, thank you. For the record, my name is Samir Kanal. I'm the Advisory Boards and Commissions Manager for the Community Safety Division, which administratively houses the Police Accountability Commission. Um, the Police Accountability Commission began its work in December 2021. Um, the commission is currently working hard on developing the structure and details of a new community police oversight board and police accountability system. And in late April or early May, we'll shift to developing the transition plan from the current system to the new system it will propose to city council. The commission will be presenting its next quarterly report in May to update more on that. Um, but at today's uh, item is about ensuring that the commission has 20 active members for the remaining time of its term. Uh, there were well over 100 community members who applied for the commission in the original solicitation. Um, this pool of applicants has been used for all previous appointments and was used again. Um, sometimes a volunteer must resign due to changing life circumstances. We unfortunately had two recent resignations. And um, after uh, staff screened the applications to ensure that there were uh, applicants who were interested, available, and eligible, um, council staff worked together to support the appointments today, which continues the collaboration of all five council offices on this commission and the process of rethinking police accountability in Portland. Um, these two appointees will represent their communities, including the small business community on the commission. I'll first pass it to Tim Pitts, who is here virtually to introduce himself, followed by Cherise Smith, who is here in person, and then we'll have a short closing comment after their introduction. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, hi, my name is Tim Pitts. Um, thank you for having me, Mayor and Commissioners. I am a small business owner and property owner, um, landlord in Portland. I work in the real estate um, industry for a little over 10 years. And so um, public safety is definitely important. And I am totally aware of the need for more um, sort of oversight to help rebuild the bond between the citizens of Portland and the police that um, serve and protect us. So I'm just really looking forward to being able to serve on this commission to do whatever I can. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. We appreciate it. Hi, Sharon. Hi, my name is Cherie Smith. Um, I run a small family owned business in the Portland area. I am a second generation Oregonian. 
um, my passions are gardening, volunteering. Um, I'm an artist. I'm a people watcher. <laughs> I'm an animal lover. And um, this is an issue, police accountability, very close to my heart. Um, I'm humbled and very excited to have been selected to serve my community in the capacity of a police com accountability commissioner. Um, I found ways to serve my community my entire life. Um, including animal rescue, volunteering for gardening landscape, tree plantings. I spent many hours volunteering uh, for elder care as well. Our seniors are a wealth of knowledge and a joy to serve. I bring my ability to see complex problems from all perspectives um, to this national concern that has come to the forefront. Um, while I never forget that it was a very courageous and selfless state trooper that risked his own life to save me and my infant daughter many years ago. I'm also very conscious of the many ongoing concerns regarding police accountability, and I'm eager to participate in finding solutions that can be implemented to save lives. Thank you for your time, all of your hard work, and together we can make a difference in our beautiful state. Thank you, Cherie. We appreciate it. Thank you, and just uh, for any member of the public who is listening, uh, we would like to uh, invite you to take part in the work of the Police Accountability Commission. There are multiple ways to uh, take part. Uh, you can uh, give advanced public comment through uh, the online web form, uh, voicemail, or postal mail. Um, this information is also available on the Police Accountability Commission's website. Um, there's also uh, the ability to join live and give public uh, comment or testimony, if you go to portland.gov slash police dash accountability and go to events um, and you'll have the information on how to join. Um, the commission welcomes public testimony from any member of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, do we have any questions at this point before I go to public testimony? Public testimony? Yes. Um, we have five people signed up. Uh, first up, we have Catherine McDowell. Welcome, Catherine. Good morning, Mayor and um, Councilors. It's lovely to be here with you again today. I'm Catherine McDowell. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of the current co-chairs of the Police Accountability Commission. I have owned and operated a women-owned law firm in downtown Portland for almost 20 years. I sit on the commission as a representative of the small business community, and I've been honored to serve on the PAC since we began meeting in December of 2021. I'm here to express my appreciation for the support you and your offices have provided to the PAC. You illustrated this today by your appointment of two excellent new commissioners. I'm also here to ask for your support on changing the PAC's timeline, which now requires our work to be done by June 9th, 2023. We ask you to more closely align this deadline to the timeline in the city's settlement agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice, which requires our work to be complete by October 29th, 2023. As you know from our prior reports, the PAC has been working extremely hard to complete the many tasks necessary to implement Measure 26217. We quickly realized, given the scope of our charge, we would need to convene multiple meetings weekly. For the last 15 months, we have typically met every Monday and Thursday evening with community engagement meetings and planning meetings on top of that schedule. We've made excellent progress, are midway through the fourth phase of our six-phase process, and we are close to completing the critical design elements of our charge. This pace and this progress has only been possible because of the huge personal commitment and sacrifice of our volunteer commission members. Unfortunately, to complete the final two phases of our work by early June, the commission would need to start meeting at least three times a week, extending our work into additional evenings and weekends. Even with this schedule, the final phases of the work will necessarily be circumscribed. I fear we will lose valuable members who simply cannot give much more time to a volunteer effort on top of their family's work and other community commitments. I also fear that the urgency created by a premature deadline could undermine the equity-based process that has successfully guided our work to this point. Like all members of the commission, 
I am 100% committed to meeting the Council's charge and delivering a set of recommendations that address the needs of all key stakeholders. We just need a little help from the Council to get there in the form of a new deadline and a few more months to complete our work. With this additional time, I'm confident that the PAC will deliver a blueprint for a new civilian police oversight board that serves all members of the Portland community, enhances public safety, and can be a model for the rest of the country. Great. Thanks and, so and, much. And I, I appreciate your being here, and I, I, I'd like to just say uh, the, the testimony last time was very compelling. I, I understand that you are volunteers, and it's not my expectation that people dedicate the entirety of their lives to volunteering on a really important city commission. So it is my understanding that an extension is in the works. That apparently has not yet been presented to you or fellow committee members, uh, but I want you to know that it has been presented to me in recent days, uh, and so I, I'm hopeful that we will will extend this very quickly. Uh, we hear you and we agree. That is terrific news. I want yeah, to thank you yeah. and, and the I, rest I of the council. I appreciate your service and your calling you. service as well. Next individual, please. Next up, we have Casey Lewis online. Welcome, Casey. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Casey Lewis. I am the uh, current other co-chair, uh, one of the three co-chairs actually of the Portland Police Accountability Commission. Um, I really want to thank the council for considering these two appointments today. Uh, Tim and Cherie, really looking forward to working with you. Um, it's incredibly rewarding work and uh, it's a fantastic group of people to work with. Um, I had more lengthy comments prepared. I think Catherine covered most of what I was going to address and I really appreciate uh, the mayor addressing that. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and uh, not take up any more of your time. Uh, just really appreciate uh, the council both making sure that we are getting these replacement members uh, and hopefully soon considering giving us the time we need to really present you with a, a quality product at the end of this process. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. And Casey, again, thank, thank you for your service. You've been great. We really appreciate it. Next up, we have Debbie Iona online. Welcome, Debbie. Debbie, you're muted. Yeah, okay. There you are. We hear you now. Oh, sorry, sorry. So now that I know that it sounds like, uh, oh, sorry, Debbie Iona, I'm one of the uh, members of the uh, Police Accountability Commission, and also want to thank you for uh, filling the vacant seats that we have. Um, and I will not go through my comments now that I've heard that it sounds like there's some hope for us uh, for an extension. I just wanted to just uh, give you a little personal story of yesterday, um, uh, at the amount of time that we are all taking on this. At 5.15, I joined the other co-chairs in a planning meeting. Then at 6.30, attended a, a community listening session. Then I spent the rest of the evening writing my statement that you're not going to hear today and also working on a, a discussion document for our Thursday night reporting and transparency subcommittee meeting. I finished that at 11 o'clock at night, sent it out to my co-chair and Samir, and at five after 11, got an email from my co-chair who asking for a little bit more clarity on you know, what we need to do to get this document ready for tomorrow night. So we're working hard and, and, and feeling a sense of panic. And so it's just such a relief to hear that this extension is in the works. So thank you very much. Yeah, and, and Debbie, uh, again, uh, you're underscoring the point. This is a volunteer opportunity. It's not supposed to be drudgery or keep you up into the wee hours of the night. And I, I appreciate that you did that. And uh, again, I, I feel that you uh, and your colleagues gave very compelling testimony the last time you were here, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have Mark Porras. Hey, Mark. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we have no objection to the addition of either Tim Pitts or Cherie Smith to the Police Accountability Commission, and we appreciate their bios and statements of interest have been made available to the public. And thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for saying that an extension is in the works. Uh, we'd still like to get our comments on the record, so I'll go fast here. We echo the consensus request from the members of the Police Accountability Commission 
um, to allow them to work until the deadline city council previously agreed to in the DOJ v. City of Portland Settlement Agreement, which is October 29th of this year. Um, council had a resolution ready to go in January that would have codified this, but it was pulled for more work by the mayor's office, and it sounds like that resolution will be brought back, so thank you. Uh, one of our members, Dan Handelman, has been attending meetings for the PAC two to three times a week, and in his capacity as a co-chair, sometimes one or two additional meetings. Uh, so that's three to five meetings per week volunteering to meet this deadline. With the city's pressure of trying to meet that June 9 deadline, some people are dropping off and some of the folks who remain seem less inclined to engage in conversations, perhaps knowing that it will make things take longer. Um, the city was creating an atmosphere that will lead, that could lead to an incomplete or inferior product that does not include the voices they sought to incorporate into the project. And in court, city attorney Robert Taylor made an offhand remark to Judge Simon about how he, the judge, should know that setting deadlines helps make people work faster. Uh, but the deadlines set for the court are to pressure paid city employees to make the expectations of the settlement agreement, not that the council agreed to. Uh, that the council agreed to. Uh, PAC members, on the other hand, are volunteers, as we keep discussing, and should not be treated in the same way. We appreciate you understanding this. At a hearing on March 1 around the PAC's quarterly report, Commissioner Rubio stated that she would support extending the deadline, and Mayor Wheeler stated that, that he would speak with the Public Safety Division about the issue, and that was two weeks ago. Um, and we appreciate, again, that you are going to bring this, hopefully soon, to us. Uh, you don't want the two new members who you approved today to burn out as soon as they join the commission. Um, and I just want to get to one more thing. Portland Cop Watch has also been asking council for a resolution to allow all city commissions to set the quorums to a majority of seated and active members. And it might not seem like a big deal uh, when a 20 person commission has only 18 seated members. However, when the number of seated members drops this low, the quorum should be adjusted such that 10 people need to be present to conduct business rather than 11, which is how quorum works right now. Uh, the PAC sent council a letter in June of last year with this request which would allow the important work that they and other city commissions are doing to continue in the face of the inevitable membership turnover that occurs on these volunteer boards. And so once again, we're asking you to make this happen. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Next up, we have Bridge Crane Charles Simca Johnson. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Charles Simco Crane Johnson, and uh, I think we should just pause for a moment and reflect on the flow here. Uh, of course, we just talked about AmeriCorps and people who are dedicating a lot of time to volunteering. Um, 20 now back up to 20 members on the Police Accountability Commission. Uh, meanwhile, some parallel structures continue. Citizens Review Committee, Independent Police Review, a lot of time. Um, and I hope that uh, somewhere in the city, um, we're looking at the metrics to get uh, the diversity we want, and especially that applies to impacted communities. Uh, and also, as we talk about the flow of the agenda, of course, kind of ironically, the next thing we're going to do is talk about, oops, possible police mistake, $60,000 of taxpayer money out the door. Um, I've been stepped back since the days of... Uh, the COAB and the COCAL. Um, but I think, you know, police accountability is expensive. If for no other reason than the fact that it's expensive, we need to think about the time we invest in the officer involved shooting report and see if we need a parallel report that gives y'all an annual review of the legal costs of the Portland Police Bureau. I don't know, hopefully, Ted will know off the top of his head since I think he retained the police commissioner hat if there's an annual summary, you can probably, of course, get it, but the public should know how many cases were settled, how many went to trial involving problems in the police bureau. We don't even need to call it police misconduct. We'll ta I'll be talking again more when that individual case comes up on the next agenda item, maybe. But if the IPR and the CRC were only addressing complaints raised by those citizens who had the strength and fortitude to go through that complaint process, it does not give us a comprehensive picture of the problems that some citizens are having interfacing with the police. So um, I don't know how the new complaint-driven process, you know, that's all going to get massaged out. Um, it's interesting that these uh, co-chairs, uh, it was really great to see Debbie again, uh, have talked about this deadline, which they didn't even know yet might be moved back to October, and this upcoming case of $60,000, which, lo and behold, is a case 
that Judge Simon is presiding over. It won't be a case now because it's gonna be a settlement. But uh, the main takeaway I want you to have from this is like, just citizen-initiated police complaints through this channel looked at by themselves without looking at the expense of settlements. Um, you know, we all remember the unfortunate premature death of Kwani's Hayes shot by police and that that cost the city more than $60,000. Um, there needs to be a holistic look at how we build a police department that every Portlander uh, and maybe not even need to be called a police department. I'm glad we have this new safety division. Anyway, you've got the meat of the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. That completes testimony. Thanks, y'all. Very good. Uh, colleagues, this is resolution. Any further questions or comments? Please call the roll. Rubio. Um, thank you, Mayor, for bringing these excellent appointments to council, and thanks to Samir for your leadership in staffing this important commission. And of course, um, thanks uh, to the testimony that we've heard from commissioners today. Um, I also want to extend our sincere gratitude for your thoughtful work thus far, um, and also appreciation to the two appointees, uh, Tim and, and Sherry, for their willingness to serve our city on this important commission, um, especially because you're bringing the voices of small business owners um, from more areas of our community to the table, and, and um, we appreciate that. Uh, please know we deeply value your service, and we're here to support you. I vote aye. Brian. Yeah, thank you, Samir. It's always good to see you. Great um, update, and I really appreciate the two people who are stepping up. I agree with Commissioner Rubio. It's so wonderful to have uh, people who have a small business experience on the on the on the team, and um, I'm glad the mayor addressed the timeline. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Appreciate your volunteers willing to step up. I vote aye. Maps. Yeah, I want to thank these volunteers for agreeing to serve on this important committee. I vote aye. Mailer. Tim and Cherie, thank you. Um, as you've heard, it's an important committee that you'll be serving on. It's one with a lot of eyeballs on it, all the way to the federal government. They'll be watching closely. And um, you're joining a, a group of very, very dedicated public servants, as you heard. Uh, the pay isn't very good. The hours have been, in my opinion, too long, and so I'm hopeful that we're creating a more uh, accommodating work environment for the important work that, that you'll be joining. Um, but I really appreciate it. Appreciate your service and your dedication. I vote aye. The resolution and the appointments are approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Samir. Thank you. Colleagues, the next item uh, is an emergency ordinance, item number 218. Pay settlement of Jorge Bello bodily injury lawsuit for $60,000 involving the Portland Police Bureau. This ordinance, colleagues, resolves a suit brought against the city back in December of 2021. Deputy City Attorney Dan Simon and Senior Claims Analyst David Farrow are here to walk us through the ordinance. Dan, are you or David going first? David, I had thought that you were going to do the presentation, but I'm happy to pull up the talking points and do the presentation if you want. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, I thought you were. <laughs> so, Dan, are you bringing it up? Thank yes, you. Yes, I will bring Appreciate it up. It. Thank you. One second, please. Yep. All right. Thank you, Mayor, City, Count City Council. This claim arises out of injuries to Mr. Bello as a result of an encounter with officers of the Portland Police Bureau while protesting near North Lombard and North Fenwick Avenue on August 24th, 2020. While PPB officers were arresting a different protester, Mr. Bello stood among other protesters and members of the press, continuing to protest the arrest and ignoring PPB commands to disperse. In an effort to affect Mr. Bellow's dispersal from the scene, one PPB officer engaged directly with Mr. Bellow in a use of force and then attempted to detain him. Mr. Bellow's attempt to yeah, engage attention to the attention of additional nearby officers who took Mr. Bell to the ground and detained him. Mr. Bellow provided evidence of treatment for complaints of head and neck injuries sustained during the arrest and evidence of nearly $10,000 in medical bills for the treatment. 
the parties negotiated directly and agreed upon a settlement of $60,000 inclusive of attorney fees and outstanding liens to resolve this claim. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions? Public testimony? We have two people signed up. Very First good. up is Mark Porras. Mark, go ahead. Yep, good afternoon again, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we have no objection to the city paying this $60,000 settlement, which is the result of police violence committed by Officer John Oliphant and others on August 24th of 2020. Uh, we appreciate council putting this item on the regular agenda due to the amount being over $50,000, although we'd prefer to see all police misconduct settlements on the regular agenda. Uh, we hope that Mr. Bellow has recovered from his injuries, and we hope that Officer Oliphant and the other cops who brutalized Mr. Bellow have been informed that the city is paying out $60,000 for their misconduct, because if they don't, then what is to stop them from brutalizing other citizens? So here we are again, knowing that the parties have already come to a financial agreement, yet we continue to urge you to engage and discuss the policies governing police behavior that keep us coming back over and over. This settlement raises the total paid out for protests between 2018 and 2020 to at least $1,204,405 now, including the Don't Shoot Portland judgment from last fall. Paragraph 170E5 of the settlement agreement states that the city make available the number, nature, and settlement amount of civil suits against PPB officers, regardless of whether the city is a defendant in the litigation. We are waiting for the city and the compliance officer to make these data readily available to the public as required. Uh, the ordinance states that the total cost to the city to settle Mr. Bellow's lawsuit is $60,000. That is just not true. Risk management's time is not accounted for in that $60,000, and neither is the time spent by city attorneys. At the very least, that information needs to be on every settlement's impact statement so the public has a more accurate picture of what the true financial cost of policing is. And finally, while the term encounter doesn't appear in Section 1 of the ordinance, the impact statement's purpose contains the boilerplate resulting from an encounter with Portland police officers' language. And we heard that also from the city attorney. It isn't fooling anyone, and the only way we're ever going to be able to have constitutional policing in Portland is to first acknowledge when officers are engaging in acts that violate the Constitution. As Council is setting up code to accompany the charter reforms taking place in 2025, Portland Cop Watch urges you to consider a rule requiring all settlements about police violence of over $5,000 to be placed before the full Council for a vote, as they are now. The Charter Commission snuck in a clause allowing all settlements of $50,000 or less to be resolved without council approval. It is permissive, meaning that settlements about police violence, which are of great concern and do not happen with the parks, water, or other bureaus, can still be required to come before council. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next up, we have uh, Bridge Crane Charles Simca Johnson. For the last time, my name is Charles Bridgecade Simka Johnson, and uh, you know Portland Cop Watch. Uh, they're able to, uh, whether it's due to better mental health or whatever, able to give you a more competent review. But I think they did touch again on the point of providing to the public a summary of these costs. It's different when a water bureau driver has a little fender bender or a serious accident and there's injury, versus when a police officer engages in behavior that will never know if it was unconstitutional or not because you all are scared to go to court. Let's be clear that this is a $60,000 fear of trial payment. And also, the city attorney, or whoever just briefed us on this, implied that Mr. Bellow was partially responsible for his injuries because he didn't fail to disperse while Mr. Uh, Officer Oliphant and the others were saying that needs to be left out. The city is deciding it does not want to litigate whether it was true that there was any problem with Mr. Bellow's conduct at the time about failing to disperse. Or maybe his attorneys have stipulated. This was an interesting agenda item because we could call it the Dan versus Dan show because one of the attorneys for the uh, uh, injured party is Dan. Dan in the city's attorney's office is telling us, oh, it was kind of okay because these people were ordered to disperse from doing their constitutional uh, demonstration. Um, please, as you extend the deadline for the Police Accountability Commission, please work to improve your transparency about all settlements involving uh, police injuries and misconduct against people that may or may not have been constitutional. We need to have that information. Uh, 
this case, it's interesting to speculate whether it was felt by the city attorney's office that was going to be held in Judge Simon's personal oversight for trial, and that was an influential factor. The courts are not just about justice. There's a whole bunch of chicanery that goes on there, but I definitely encourage you, since we have an injured party, and his two attorneys, I think, have said this is a settlement they find in his best interest, get this $60,000 out of the door as an emergency today uh, while thousands of people continue to live unsheltered in our city. Thank you. That completes testimony. Very good. Colleagues, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, this is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. And let's see, item number 219, please. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Authorize competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for the 1900 building roof replacement project. Colleagues, the Office of Management and Finance owns the 1900 building, an office building for city bureaus and programs. The 1900s building's roof is over 25 years old and it has leaks that are causing damage to newly constructed office spaces below. This item authorizes our procurement team to solicit bids for these needed repairs. We have cons facilities construction manager, Jana Juro here to walk us through the report. Welcome. Jana, you're muted. There you go. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to get unmuted. Um, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, by now. Um, Mayor, commissioner, staff, and public participants. Um, as the mayor mentioned, my name is Jana Jarreau, and I'm a capital project manager that's been working on this project. Um, the building is located, and I'm going to share some photos with you in a PowerPoint, and just to give you a sense of where it's at and what we're talking about. Can you see my screen now? Nope. Hmm. Okay, well, I did hit share screen, so I'm not sure, but I'm not um, a full Zoom person, but I will, I know you've had a long morning, so I'm going to just go ahead and talk. Um, the building is located at um, 1900 Southwest 4th Avenue. It is one of three buildings in a complex that we share with PSU. Sorry, you can't see these pictures. They'd be helpful in getting them to you. But, um, Jan, I, th I think all of us are, are familiar with it. Pretty familiar with it? Okay. So, yeah, don't, yeah. Don't I was doing that for the public. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, this roofing project is to replace, and I do have pictures of the roof too, but the roof, as was mentioned, I think it's a little closer to 23 years old. The building was built in 1998. So, but we have had leaks, like the mayor mentioned in his summary. So, I really think just the main thing is this, we have gone to design with this project. We had, um, did a full analysis, including an, an analysis for an eco or green roof to make sure if we could meet that. However, when we analyzed both the full section eco roof and a lesser section that is also supposed to help retaining water, the structure of the roof just wasn't designed for that type of a roof. So we have three alternate roofs in our bid package when it goes out. Um, all of them will fit within the amount we've requested in this ordinance. And we would greatly appreciate the opportunity to move forward on this project as soon as possible. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have um, if you want more specifics on the roof. Uh, very good. And uh, Jana, one of the questions I asked when, when this was presented to me was whether there was a warranty available on the roof and it's my understanding it expired is that correct yes i mean we we assume it was a 20-year roof warranty um we don't have a copy of it but it is definitely expired got it so okay, it's thanks, within Ian. a couple of years and in the last three years we've had additional leaks and repaired them with staff but it's definitely um, in need of replacement. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, any questions, <laughs> colleagues? All right, we're going to give you a new roof. Call the roll. Wait, oh, do we wait, have public no testimony? Uh, no testimony, and it's a, a first reading. Oh, you're right. Uh, Jan, I do have a follow-up. Why is, why is this a non-emergency ordinance if water is leaking into 
our facilities? Why, uh, well, we we successfully repaired those leaks last year, and honestly, this year it has not had severe leaking, um, very minor, and repairs are made quickly. The reason we want to go ahead and do it, this roof is being, you know, we we have um, a major maintenance budget that can support the replacement of this roof without causing any additional funding to the staff. All right. Do, do, you, do you have any objections to me moving this as an emergency ordinance? No, I think that was made an emergency ordinance only because we're ready to go out to bid. And we but, need it's, but it's not, is my point. So, right. uh, colleagues, exactly. I'd like to amend, move an amendment to put an emergency ordinance or put an emergency clause on this ordinance. The emergency cited is the potential for water leakage into a very expensive and currently occupied city facility. Can I get a second? Second. Any discussion? Call the roll on the amendment, please. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment's adopted to the main motion as amended. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Rubio? Aye. <coughs> Ryan? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The ordinance is adopted as amended. Thanks, Jana. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you very much. It. Yeah, you bet. Uh, 220 is a second reading. Authorized competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Northeast 6th Drive pump station upgrade project for an estimated amount of $4,540,000. This is a second reading of a non-emergency ordinance. We saw a really what I thought was a fantastic presentation on this and we had the opportunity for public testimony. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item 221, also a second reading. Authorized request for proposal and contract agreements for the vehicle towing and storage services and abandoned vehicle towing and storage services. Any further discussion on this item? Yeah, Mr. 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 Mayor, um, I should probably place this into context. Uh, colleagues, you might remember we heard this item last week. It deals with um, PBOT's efforts to or desire to um, upgrade our uh, towing contract for the Portland and Multnomah County area. Um, I will also remind you that um, when we heard testimony last week, there was a consensus on the towing advisory board and uh, every member of council uh, that the fees that were proposed in the ordinance were too low and they were too low for at least two reasons. One, the city wasn't doing cost recovery um, for um, our role in running the towing program. Number two, we heard from towing providers who said given what we were charging for towing, uh, they could not pay their employees a living wage. Upon hearing those concerns, I pledged to work with uh, council offices, PBOT and the towing advisory board to develop a fee schedule that does a better job at cost recovery so for the past week we've been engaged in that conversation and I want to thank each and every one of your offices uh, um, for uh, um, helping us get smarter in this space here is the uh, consensus that I think I heard in terms of moving forward with a new fee schedule for um, uh, towing in uh, Multnomah County I propose that over the next five years, PBOT increase tow rates every year by about 15%. I also propose that we add a cost of living adjustment to our fee schedule. Um, if we take these actions by 2026, tow rates in the city of Portland will, will roughly match the rates in our surrounding municipalities. Now, if this path forward is acceptable to council, I can just direct PBOT uh, to implement that fee schedule. There's no need to actually introduce an ordinance uh, to make that so. So uh, um, I think what I should do here is to pause and see, uh, um, take the temperature of council to see if that proposal, which I just outlined, is acceptable. Sure. So have the towers been involved in this discussion as well and they're supportive of this approach? Yes. I mean, great. All right. I, 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 I applaud you. I appreciate you because we, we heard fairly consistent testimony and, I, uh, uh, and I've been impressed that on multiple occasions under multiple circumstances, you've been very open to meeting with people and trying to reach a consensus conclusion. So I, I just want to say I really appreciate that because I was uncomfortable with the fact that the tab was universally opposed to what was being proposed. And that, that 
left me with some big questions. So I really appreciate your taking leadership on this. Well, th um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and the praise goes both ways. Uh, the dialogue I've had with you and the Towing Advisory Committee uh, has made this ordinance uh, um, better. I think we're uh, we're going to do a better job at cost recovery. We'll also uh, do better uh, um, by, by virtue of the folks who have, are out there actually keeping our roadways clear. So if we have uh, an informal consensus on that, I can just direct PBOT to move forward with the new fee schedule. And we can just now, Mr. Mayor, I believe we can just move to the uh, vote on the uh, ordinance, which has not been amended. Uh, um, if you wanna have a little bit of a reminder of what this ordinance actually does, uh, PBOT is requesting. No. Okay, well, boom, let's go. <laughs> or, I'll hand we, it back to you. <laughs> we all remember. And thank you for your great work. We sure thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate Please it, Mayor. Rubio, um, I want to thank you, Commissioner Maps um, and Mark, uh, for really uh, just uh, tackling this so so quickly. Um, I'm really, really um, pleased to hear that there's such a good outcome and that, that was a good plan. So just really want to appreciate you on, on taking action on that so quickly and addressing exactly the things you know that we all just talked about. So um, happy to vote aye. Ryan. Yes, agreed. A lot of good dialogue between last week and today. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Maps. Uh, I want to thank the members of the public who reached out to me, uh, my office, about this item. I want to thank the TOE Advisory Board for their input on this item. I want to thank my uh, colleagues on council uh, um, who provided their thoughts on how to make uh, this ordinance better, fairer, and more equitable. And finally, I want to thank my team at PBOT for their work on this item. I vote aye. Wheeler. Yeah, this is, uh, this is really solid work. I appreciate it and uh, appreciate you working with, with community members who came in to express concerns. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. We are adjourned until 2 p.m. And colleagues, just a heads up, I have an absence filed at 3 p.m. today and uh, I'll be turning the gavel at 3 p.m. over to Commissioner Ryan. We're adjourned.